All right, we are live. Now, this is just going to be a solo stream without Morton this time. And it's going to be me taking your questions and um, doing some fun sculpting here. We're going to be taking this guy further. So this stream here is kind of split up into three parts, or rather the streaming we've done this week is kind of split into three parts. The first one is uh, low frequency. That's where we're doing the overall design. And then the second one is mid frequency. And that's where I'm refining this guy. And today we're going to be doing mid to some high frequency. So I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Feel free to come with your questions as well. I'm just going to wait a tiny bit for this to pick up a little bit of steam. And uh, then uh, we will go from here. So feel free to come with any questions you have. And uh, I'll just answer those. Since I am doing a solo stream today, that's going to be a lot more difficult to sculpt and take questions at the same time. So I'm just going to have to divide my attention, split my brain into two or three parts. But let's see. So let's see how that goes. Cool. So if people can just comment in the chat that everything is visible and nice, then I will just get started with the sculpting here, just to make sure. Always really paranoid. And the first comment is here. So I will assume we are live. Hey, <laughs> nice seeing you here. So I'm just going to continue sculpting this guy. So I already have um, a fairly decent base. I've also started breaking the symmetry up and we are around 8 million polygons. I've been using a matte cap here. That's a uh, really fun matte cap. It's a very, it's a really beautiful matte cap, but it's not a particularly good matte cap, if that makes sense, in the sense that it's, uh, you can see the differences between this. You do, can just do this with shift and S, this and this, for instance, how much more contrast there is in the left one. So it's really fun and nice to look at the stuff on the left, but for something like the um, for something like actual sculpting, I far prefer to have something more like what's here, or you can even do something like uh, the basic material, which is what I've been using most of the time. This is a entirely utilitarian sculpt of matte cap here. This this is not pretty, but uh, it responds to lighting, which is great. And it shows you basically everything. Then you have matte caps like this. That's terrible because this stuff here shows you way too much stuff, which means that if you were to take this into uh, a render engine like Cycles Arnold, and you were to just put this in, you would see a lot less because you're now afraid of pushing things too hard because every single stroke you do, you can see. So everything just gets softer. I use this for debugging, but I don't, I never, ever, ever use it for sculpting. And you can see now that the model looks completely different. So uh, yeah, we're just going to be uh, detailing and refining this guy up. Uh, it, it's not, it's not pr just detailing, it's, it's overall, overall refinement. When it comes to refining a sculpt, I, I always consider the mid frequency and high frequency be to be going together. Let me actually explain that one because that requires us a tiny bit of explanation. So what people tend to do wrong when it comes to high frequency is that you have the different frequencies. You have the um, low, then you have mid, and then you have high. And low and mid, they kind of go hand in hand, right? Where you have shapes like uh, we have the shape here. This might be like low frequency, this kind of stuff. And then we have more stuff that breaks it up. That's more like mid frequency. And you have to make them go hand in hand because it, it's impossible. You can't just have a shape that goes like this, that's low. And then you just break it up with some soft shape. You have to refine it. But the mistake everyone is doing is they are treating low and mid as cohesive, so they integrate well, and then they're treating high as some stuff you put on top of it, where you just go over here with just a poor brush and, you know, even stuff like the, uh, like the flip mode's face kit and such, just throwing that on top there and uh, just kind of keep doing this. And this is not a particularly good way of doing it because 
here you're just treating it as is literally just a thing on top of it when this isn't really the case. If you were to look at like macro photography of stuff, you're going to start to see that we have lines going like here, we have lines going over, and it's really hard to see when one frequency begins and one frequency ends. And one of the reasons for this is because frequencies are entirely made up. You, a, a doctor can't dissect a body and be like, all right, yeah, we found a mid frequency and found a low frequency, and here we've extracted some high frequency. It, it's just a way for us to to help it help uh, out when we're sculpting. And that is, of course, a very useful tool, but it's not a, a real thing. <laughs> it's it's a made up thing that we find to be useful as a tool. So this is this is where it becomes difficult to even define what is high, mid and what's low frequency, because different people regard different things as different frequencies, because depending on your medium, for instance, or how close you're going to be sculpting, for instance, if you are working as a traditional clay sculptor, then you you don't really have access to high or like not even clay sculpting, but with marble sculpting. You, you practically don't really have access to the the uh, the high frequency. You just can't really do that. So then your frequencies, you still have high, mid and low, just that what you consider to be high here wouldn't be something we would consider to be high. So we are just consuming that this is like different frequencies. But what you can start to see now when you start to block these kind of things in and you start to break this up, these lines are going to start to spread out like so. So these are just going to start to like break up and subdivide further. And when the, the more these guys subdivide, the more of finer details you're getting. And this is how in a large way the fine frequencies work for a character. It's not just a uh, an alpha you stamp on top of it. This kind of stuff is really what becomes the defined frequency. So you can keep subdividing this further and further and further where you just it just keeps going further and further. So this is a really handy way of uh, of dealing with this. So this is how I consider it. So instead of it just being something we just add on top, it's something that we're going to keep I'm just going to keep adding more and more and more information to it. And you kind of get a lot of the high frequency for free. You do, of course, have to use alphas as well, because otherwise you have to sculpt literally everything is crazy. But the better your sculpt the details are, the better everything is going to become. Like it, it's a whole different world. And um, so the better your mid frequency is, the better your high frequency is, the better your high frequency is, the better your textures are going to be. The better your textures are, the easier it is to look to have something. The easier it is to look to have something, the better your render is going to be. So a lot of this stuff is very connected. So if you're texturing something, a lot of times you're going to misdiagnose things because you're just going to assume that actually we need to modulate the roughness map or break it up or additional subsurface scattering settings or whatever. But a lot of times you just need to break up the model up further. Not saying that you don't need good maps as well, of course you do, just that um, there is... Uh, a lot of the times, you, well, in every single case, you have to be sure that your high frequency is working because if not, then you're you're polishing something that that is fundamentally not really there. Do you pull group some areas and then see your mesh for better mesh flow and then go ahead with sculpting the character? For this guy here, I did do see your meshing. I didn't do any polygroups. I find that whenever I use polygroups, I often run into more trouble than <laughs> I'm saving here. So what I did, I just did a dynamesh sculpt, which should be here still. Yeah, this is from the last stream. You can see this on the last stream from two days ago. So I just dynamesh this one here, or I, I duplicated him and zero meshed it, and then I just been taking him further. And in a perfect world, I would have uh, zero meshed or not zero meshed. I would have retopologized this, probably using the new Topogon three because it's a fantastic tool. Tutorial on that as well on our channel from a few weeks ago, a month ago, or so now, a bit more than that. And uh, yeah, then I'll go, go with that. But I, I do prefer to zero mesh something at this point because then, I, like, just for quick work in progress topology, just because then it becomes much, much, much easier to sculpt, and you can so you can go up to like. 7 mil, 8 mil, can even subdivide to like 30 mil and such, and just gets much easier to to work with this. Yeah, so I'm just going over this, and I find I find this to be a very useful technique and something that a lot of people don't do, where I just keep going over the same areas over and over and over again. I don't necessarily do it like right off to each other, but I keep like working on one area, then I move on to the next, and I really keep refining 
areas over and over and over again. It's not like I touch one area and then I move on to, and then I'm done with it. No, we keep refining things over and over again. If you have to do retop, will you do it before or after high frequency? I always, always, always do it before high frequency because whenever you do retopology, you probably will have to reproject some areas. And so first, if you if you reproject it, you can't really reproject your layers. You could technically, but it's a bit of pain. You have to do it twice and such. But um, it's just a bit painful there. But also, you have to re-sculpt areas because not all areas are going to project that well. So I definitely prefer to do that before. And also, like you, there is no, there isn't really a benefit to reproject to to doing the topo, like to waiting with a topo at that point because the the high frequency shouldn't really be pushing and pulling the silhouette. So uh, I I do that always before the high frequency, much easier. And just a reminder that it is Black Friday. Today is the actual Black Friday, so we have a lot of sales on our on our marketplace flipnormals.com and we have a lot of very good products which are 50% off all our official products are 50% off so that would be all of the normals exclusives are 50% off so that would be something like introduction to anatomy for instance that we came out with a few months ago that covers how to well how to do everything when it comes to anatomy this is taught by myself we have character realistic character poker masterclass also covering how to do a full character from scratch so i highly recommend particularly like introduction to anatomy here for instance which is covering really most things i know about anatomy so this here is really useful so i'm just going to send this in the chat for people who are interested in checking that out so uh, yeah tons of really cool products on sale so just check out flipnormals.com for that and now back to the sculpting and if you guys have recommend like uh, have uh, want recommendations for products as well, uh, let me know, and I'll I'll see if I can get to that in a chat. Are there any uh, AL is saying any tutorials on props for video games that you would recommend? Oh boy, is there? Let's see here. We have Simon Fuchs. Simon Fuchs has fantastic products on. Uh, on flip normals let's see if they will load here there we go so simon is uh, is us i think he's still yeah these are also 30 percent off now i think he's still at blizzard the senior artist at blizzard absolutely incredible work this came out not too long ago this one here covers how to make this this from scratch like this whole gun from scratch absolutely fantastic so sending this one over so uh, yeah this one here brilliant brilliant tutorial uh, it just looks gorgeous so highly recommend that one you can also check out a creator on flip normals called chamfer zone and chamfer zone uh, it has a lot of similar style products to seamer folks just just a little bit different different kind of slightly different style slightly different software but but very similar uh, in in terms of scope and quality so chamfer zone as well is fantastic Any courses you would recommend for environment art? Oh boy, do we have that. So this is where we need to talk to our buddies. Fast Track tutorials. Fast Track have some of the best environment tutorials on, uh, like probably made in terms of uh, just general environment tutorials. They're really, really, really good. So um, this is made mostly made by an artist called Emil Sliegers who actually worked for us for some time as well for Flip Normals. So he has made a lot of uh, really cool tutorials for like for Flip Normals ourselves. And we have some of his, let me just find that. Where did he go? You can just go to, to here we go. Here we have Fast Track tutorials. So Fast Track, he, this is made by, like I said, Emil Sleegers. And he, uh, he used to be an environmental artist in the games industry so there's tons of fantastic art here if you go by like best selling you can find which ones are going to be the most popular here like for instance here is a uh, these are also very affordable as well so um this is uh how to make this whole environment in uh, in in unreal and i think max so back to this now 
I see Mario Kors in the making coming along. Any teasers? Um, let's see, actually. Let me just move, get some stuff up here. So we don't really have teasers per se in terms of the... Um, in terms of uh, like the, the product isn't there, but we're, we are working on like renders and such of it. So we are... This is this is what is kind of what the final result is going to look like. This is with a crap ton of noise, of course, here. But like this is what we're going to be texturing. So this is not done. So don't take this as the final thing. This is made by a fantastic artist who, of course, is getting full credit in the tutorial here. So uh, we, we're texturing this asset here and putting this into Blender and then texturing this fully in Mari. And then we're just going through all the different things you need to know about Mari. Like one of the big things there is the node graph, for instance. So I'm just spending a lot of time making sure that we can really utilize the node node system there, just making sure it's fully up to date. Because when I was when I was texturing in Mari for production, it was all layer based. Nodes had just started to come out when I was texturing in production, but it was it wasn't really developed properly yet. But now nodes are like essentially fully replacing the layer system. So really, just got to be sure that that's something that's covered correctly. Frank was saying, what about the modular for environment? Or is there something in Flip Normals? Yep. All right, let's talk about this. So we have, let's see if we can find it here. I want to be sure that I don't just scroll through tutorials all along. <laughs> but we have, we definitely have modular, modular tutorials. We have so many tutorials. We have like 88 products here. And uh, let's see here where we are at. Modular art for games. This is also an Emil Sliger's tutorial. Uh, guy behind fast track so this is this covers how to create modular um, how to create modular environments like this where we just yeah just focus on making like something simple and then turning it into something modular so yeah tons of really cool tutorials on on flip normals or I'm, I'm genuinely really proud of the catalog we have They're both of our own tutorials uh, but also of like all the incredible creators we have also, if you if you're interested in like selling tutorials on Flipmoms, just like just uh, you can check out the application process on the site, and um, then if you get approved, you can you can sell your own your own things. I know there are a lot of fantastic artists out there who are like interested in making tutorials, but they they haven't necessarily like fully like taken the plunge into doing that yet. And I highly recommend like making tutorials. You go, first, you're just going to learn a lot from it, but it can also be a nice additional income and you can help a lot of people learn a lot of things, particularly if you have a few years of production experience. There's there's so many things that are basically only known by uh, by production artists. Like there's a big, big, big skill difference in, in even just like what knowledge is available between what's publicly available and uh, and what's being done in inside productions. It's not necessarily that it's like secret stuff. It's just it's just difficult to to find people who teach this kind of stuff to a very high level. A lot of YouTube tutorials and such, they're, they're teaching stuff to a very like basic level, which of course is fine as well, but it's really useful just to be able to show exactly how it's done. Like that's what we were doing with Flip Normals, right? With uh, our tutorials there where we showing you how to actually do something for a production that you, we, we know where to cheat, we know where you shouldn't cheat and just like making something that looks really good. Kieran is saying, I just finished university a couple of months ago where I studied 3D. Thanks for, uh, for the normals for carrying me hard. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> much appreciated. Where did you uh, study and uh, did you have a good time? So yeah, you can see just now, this is what I've been doing now during the stream so far. Just been up-pressing the left side. And uh, so you can see the difference between left and right. And this is done, probably could have done some asymmetry here, but I just think it's fun to don't really to not really play around or to play without round with asymmetry. I find that I get a lot more natural result that way. Obviously, it takes much longer to do it, and it's a bit of a nightmare when it comes to topology and UVs and all that, but at the end of the day, I just want to have fun and make something cool. If anyone else has just been graduating from university, let me know. I, I would I would love to hear some like stories in the chat <laughs> about people's experiences. People's experiences going to uni are, are so different, where some people are just having the worst time ever and other people are absolutely loving it, depending, of course, in a large degree to where you are studying. 
I'm going to try to keep this uh, the uh, university rants to a minimum in this stream, though they might appear. Something that's really cool as well sometimes is to sculpt upside down. <laughs> a bit of a stupid one, but you, you get to see the character in a, in a very, from a literally a new angle. So you get to see things in a different uh, in a different way and you just get to your brain it just sees things in a different way as well. I noticed that the angle is actually different, so you get to see things in an actual different way, but you, your brain just kind of resets. It's um, it's a little bit like if you go into a perfume shop and you get like smell some coffee ground between each session that you kind of get a little bit like a palate cleanser. Our battalion Scotland, Kieran said, was good to be given projects to focus on, but learning was 90% self-learning. So I wouldn't say I recommend that unit for 3D artists. Yeah, that's what I see so often where universities are, uh, they're, they're almost just self-taught centers where you, you might be given assignments, but then you're, you're essentially expected to just figure things out yourself. And uh, I don't think that's cool. <laughs> I mean, if it was, if maybe in, in Scotland, universities might be free, I don't actually know, but here in, at least in England, they're absolutely not free. So, uh, yeah, that's what I, that, that's what really annoys me a lot of times, where a lot, a lot of times, every single time where people are paying, like in here, it's like nine, nine K, a bit more than that, and like pounds, and uh, just the quality just isn't really up to the standard you would expect for that amount of money. To put it like this, you can buy a lot of flip model tutorials for nine thousand pounds a year. I think if you're if you if you want to learn CG on a budget and you want to like get really good real fast, move in a move live live somewhere where it's cheap to live and then just buy tutorials online from where on subjects that that you need you don't necessarily have to buy like all the tutorials at once more like if you want to learn like sculpting buy a sculpting tutorial and learn as much as you can about that then you want to in, expand into retopology get the tutorial for that and that that we're going to learn so much and and also you're going to have unlike university lectures and such you're going to have tutorials by the by like actual experts in the field of which is definitely not the case for lectures and such so University of schools are definitely not needed to to learn to learn CG. Why are there no courses about rendering characters in UE five? Yeah, you, Unreal Engine five is is still like pretty new, and um, uh, Morton and I want to we want to make tutorials on on unreal that's something we we really want to get into we have we don't know exactly when but that's something we definitely want to get into but yeah it just seems to be pretty new to be honest it's just going to take a little bit of time for that stuff to come but it, it will come particularly now as there's a big push for unreal content not just in games but in in film as well commercials so then it's going to be a lot of that kind of stuff I start in two weeks. Um, in two weeks, Seabrush tips for beginner. We we have a free YouTube video on well on YouTube, which is um, a, a really good beginner tutorial for that. So you can just search for like Seabrush on YouTube. I think it's probably going to be one of the first ones, or like Seabrush beginner guide, and you're probably going to find that. We also have um, an introduction to Seabrush uh, as well, which is going to be up here somewhere. This one here which covers basically everything you need to know about the software. I'm just going to throw this into the chat. This one here covers really like everything like there is you want to know about Seabrush and then we sculpt a an ogre at the end as well. So th that's a solid course. It's a few years old now, but honestly, they haven't really added anything, <laughs> anything of note in Seabrush over the last few years. So uh, it still is like perfectly up to date.
advantages and disadvantages of software updating recently, like often. The advantages is you get a lot of new tools real fast, which is fun. Disadvantages is that documentation becomes out of date real fast. That's what you saw when Blender 2.8 came out, that essentially all tutorials up until that point were kind of useless, unless you knew the software really well and you can kind of translate things. But for a beginner, you couldn't really watch any like pre 2.8 videos. So that's always an issue when um, when, when software updates is not just from a point that oh it annoys me because I'm I'm creating tutorials it's also because there is tutorials is a large part of the ecosystem for just getting new artists into the software so if that ecosystem is, is broken that's obviously a bit of an issue just takes time to rebuild that but you know software companies are gonna software companies so shouldn't really they, they can't really take that into account So I'm just going over this part here. Now, I pretty much only touched this area, so I should probably expand this a little bit here. When you're at it, like something like 7 million polygons, if you subdivide once more, then you are going to be much, much, much higher, like mid-20s in terms of poly count. And particularly using something like the clay brushes, you, you can... The clay brushes are really polygon hungry in terms of like what, what poly count they require to look good. So it's, it's really tempting to just keep subdividing but when i'm at this level this is where i'm just i'm just switching more to like damn standard and such and standard brush because then you can really squeeze out a lot more resolution from your subdivision level like 28 million polygons that is not the level you want to be at unless you are at the uh, like at the deep full-on detailing stage like full-on pores hi are you using a mouse or a pen uh, I'm definitely, definitely, definitely using a pen. You really don't want to be sculpting with a mouse. It, that's even a, even a weird one to me that that's... That there are people who are like actually advocating for using a, a mouse when sculpting. And you're just going to get hurt. Like physically, you're just going to get hurt. Uh, it's, it's a very bad idea to do that. Some people might be okay at that. But in the same way that some people are okay not wearing a seatbelt when driving. If sooner or later, it's... Um, is going to come back to bite you. I mean, I have issues in my arm and wrist from sculpting with a pen. And if if I'd done that with a, a mouse, I would have been like properly injured. Shinyu is saying, hello, I wonder if there are any courses that focus specifically on sculpting the skeleton. I don't really know of any courses that focus specifically on sculpting the skeleton, to be perfectly honest. The the closest thing I would say would be like the introduction to anatomy course that we that we, we launched. But uh, yeah, I don't know specifically about the skeleton. That's uh, that, That's getting pretty granular as well in terms of the anatomy. Can actually just take a tiny little of like a detour here. Uh, I wanna talk talked about the um, one of the best exercises for for learning that, like learning how to sculpt the skeleton and learning how to sculpt really like how to level up your skills. This is something I do constantly with my mentees. One of the best exercises you can possibly do is to uh, try to sculpt. If you want to get better at sculpting the skull, for instance, try your best to sculpt the skull from memory. This is very difficult. Like it, it's just a it's just a very 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 difficult thing to do. But it's one of the best ones, best exercises. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show you what I mean by that. So I'm gonna try to sculpt them, sculpt memory. This is not gonna be the best I can because I just wanna rush through here. But I'm gonna show you what I mean. So I know that there are cavities here for the eyes. I know we have like the brow here. The, the um, we know we have the frontal eminence up here. So I'm just sculpting all these things. I know that we have the nose in here the nose cavity and then I know we have a cavity in here under the sagomatic and I'm not using any reference for this and uh, good and bad right <laughs> relating to this uh, check out the latest video we just came out with which is Morton and I sculpting a camel from uh, from scratch without reference it's a pretty pretty fun video where we, we can talk a little bit about this as well so the point about this is that 
right now, I'm not using any reference, which means that I'm genuinely, I assume here, right, I'm genuinely doing the best I can. So I'm putting down everything I know about sculpting a skull. And um, in the beginning, that's not going to be a lot, just because skulls are really, really difficult. So by putting down everything you know about sculpting a skull, you're probably going to exhaust everything you know within about 20 minutes, half an hour or so. So that means that you, you truly get to see what level you're at when it comes to well, sculpting a skull. And that's awesome because it means that you, you get data on that. You just get actual data on, on sculpting skulls. So uh, I'm just gonna take this a little bit further. Again, this is not the best I can do with sculpting a skull, but you know, it's not, okay, I was gonna say it's not terrible. It's not great either, but you know, <laughs> that's not the point. So assuming this here is now correct, then what you do is once you've been doing this and once you've been taking it up to the highest level you possibly can, then you are going to load in a real skull. In this case here, you can use go to tools and there's a model here by Ryan Kingsline. That's awesome. This is a really good, um, uh, this is a really good anatomy reference. And here we have a skeleton. We can just take this girl in here and then we could um, just throw this in here and then we could just scale this lady up like so. And then we can just move the pivot up and then we can use the split screen feature like so. And then we could go in here and then we can start to see the differences. We can start to see now where we went wrong. And then I can I can start to draw on top of this. So this is where we can start to see here. Oh, cool. This goes up like so. It goes up here and here and here. And we can draw on top of this. And we can see how, how right we are, how wrong we are. Here, for instance, we can see that I'm missing an angle here. We can see here we're drawing in the, uh, the nose. And this goes down like so, and this is this is missing a lot of fidelity and it's too close. So this way you get to truly, truly, truly see your level. I'm like, ah oh, crap, I forgot that there are teeth. All right, cool, I'm getting in here and seeing the arch here, this is too low, so this needs to go uh, further down. And the jawline, you know, tons of these kind of things. Oh, this is way too square, so we can like round this off. And this way you get to properly feedback it yourself. You get to like truly get into a, into like a into like a workflow where you get to like actually self feedbacking yourself, and then you can of course go in here and um, and like fix these kind of things. That can be useful as well. But what you can do, you can just do another one. So this is something I always tell my mentees. Where this is a fantastic useful exercise. But what I specifically tell them is you should do two exercises here or two sculpts: one with ref and one with no ref. And I know there are some MTs listening here, so you have heard this before. So, and you just keep doing this over and over and over again. You do one without any reference, which is what I just did here. And then you do reference and you either sculpt it based on reference, which is a fantastic way of doing it, that you get to really learn from that. And then you do it again without reference. And every single time, you're just gonna level up a tiny bit. The thing with this exercise is that it's more like a, almost, almost like a permanent notch here. Because if you're just sculpting something with reference every single time, then you don't really truly see what the issues are. Then you're just kind of lining things up and such. But this way, you get to intuitively figure out here, for instance, we're like, ah, oh, crap, this one here is actually way off. And when you, you see the solution, you're like, oh, of course, of course, of course, I understand that. In the camel video, the Morton and I did, we have like the legs, right, going like down like so, and so for the camel, and my hind leg is way too close to it. Like, so this distance here is way off. I haven't sculpted a camel before, but now I know that the leg is way further back like so. For the foot from the top view, the camel video, I basically did this, but I'm learning now that it's way more like this. And this, this is something I wouldn't have known if I hadn't like sculpted wrong with a reference. So no ref and then ref. It's one of the most powerful ways I know how to improve your sculpting real fast. And this is how I'm doing it for anatomy as well. Like when I was making intro to anatomy, I was, um, I, was I had to study a lot because it turns out making an intro to anatomy course, not super easy. So when when I was doing that, I had to just level up my game a lot. I've been sculpting for for a long, long, long time now. And um, you kind of get an intuitive feeling for anatomy after some time. But that doesn't mean you know how to teach the bloody thing because anatomy is really difficult. So if you're talking about like, uh, you can kind of sculpt the neck up and such, but specifically, where is the origin and assertion of the sternocleidomastoid? For that, you just need to practice. You just need to drill in the technical anatomy. So 
I just did this. I just tried to sculpt a lot of anatomy from memory, and then I tried to watch it or do it again from uh, uh, from reference. Uh, not just I didn't just try to do that. I also tried to rem remember the names as well, and that's how I can remember all the external, uh, like the extensor carpa radialis brevis, uh, extensor digitorum, all the all the crazy names for the forearm, for instance, because I was genuinely like, trying to memorize it from like just trying to like recite what they were like and then uh, and then like trying like just correcting it so it's a fantastic way to learn this kind of stuff here's a good one uh what kind of exercise would you recommend for getting better at poly modeling honestly if you're talking about retopology at least then uh, then do a lot of retopology for, for that, like honestly, just do a lot more of it. Uh, but for uh, that, retopology is a bit different, right? Of course, from, from general poly modeling, because retopology, then you're just overlaying things onto an existing mesh. If you are if you want to get better poly modeling for props, that might be what the, the um, person I was asking, then try to find different kinds of props and then try to model them with very simple shapes. Most props can really be simplified into a few basic shapes like a cube or a cylinder or a sphere and most shapes are really a combination of this like then you can this might be a triangle which is just a cube cut into into uh, like scaled in here it might be a mix between and maybe the shape is like this and it goes into this this is a combination of a cylinder from the side view with a box right a, or a sphere cut into half so there are there's so many simple shapes that you can simplify things into so really try to, to just block it into into simple shapes and then you can start to um to like improve the topology and like make that more advanced as you go but uh, yeah just good simple shapes i recommend trying to model everything on your desk i think that's a very good exercise because that that way you get a lot of variety and then once you you've done a few of those once you've f kind of figured out how to get better at that and it becomes more intuitive then you can take like one more to like a final level and then try to make them like sub d ready as well like if you can because that, that's a whole different level as well Adam is saying, hello Henning, I've been listening to your disembodied voices in my study for so long, it's kind of weird seeing your face. <laughs> yeah, Thank you, I heard a lot where people are surprised that the voices have faces. <laughs> turns out, it turns out we do, yeah, uh, if you want to see more of that, I guess, <laughs> we have a lot of podcasts as well now, where we, we're just in the videos as well, so that's, that's really fun, really fun to do those. Henning, you look like your voice. That's a compliment. <laughs> Thank you, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you so much. Just trying to see if there are any more questions here. That's what happens when I'm not really sculpting. Kerhab is saying, first time in a stream. Well, welcome. Thank you so much for stopping by. We, uh, we're going to be doing more streams over Black Friday, but also just more streams in general. Just We just want to do more content. Now that, uh, I'm not sure if, if any of you have watched uh, the first podcast we did now again, like it's just called like number one <laughs> and, and everything breaks, where we're just talking about why we've been absent from, from making videos for some time. Essentially the too long didn't read version of that, I guess too long didn't watch, is that we've been rebuilding the whole marketplace. This marketplace here, that, which is, where did it go? This marketplace here that uh, has 50% off on uh, on a lot of products, 30% off on a lot. And um, we just had to rebuild the whole thing. So this took us absolutely ages. It meant that we didn't really have too much time for, for YouTube tutorials. So 
that that's where we have been. So uh, Morton, for instance, has been in development land for a very long time. I have been in Craven tutorial land, and now we finally can meet in the middle and we can do YouTube videos again, which we're very excited about. We just want to do more of that. We really enjoy that. It's a, it's a fun, fun thing to do. And also, I, I really hope it makes a difference to people as well. So uh, it's really motivating when people people have said that it's, it's had an impact on them. So that definitely like keeps us pushing further when it comes to, uh, yeah, just doing more YouTube videos. We also take requests for like podcast episodes we should talk about as well, or discussion, the things we should discuss in the videos or just like general things for YouTube. Like for instance, the one we just did where Mort and I, we were, uh, were sculpting a, a, a horse, or sorry, a camel, a desert horse from, uh, from memory. This one is, uh, it's a stupid one. <laughs> Let me see if I can find that one. You spoke many times about flipping almost being a purpose and impacting, wanting to um, uh, impact uh, people's lives. Just wanted to say that's super inspiring. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. It's uh, I, I think it's I think it's important stuff we're doing here when it comes to. You know, just helping people hopefully get into the games film industry, or just just make a living out of doing creative stuff. Either if you're if you're if you're a seller of normals and you can make a living from selling stuff, which I think is fantastic. We we've been able to pay out a lot of money to creators, which helps people. Some people have actually started going full time for that, which is awesome. Then of course the tutorials people can buy as well, and then of course the YouTube channel as well. It's really important to me that uh, that we keep doing that one as well. What I like about our YouTube channel is that we have like something like 200, 306, 460 videos now. I think 460 videos. I kept counting up in my head there. And I like that we're just doing standalone videos where they're just like the intro topogon, for instance, there isn't really a commercial version of that. It's just made for YouTube. It's YouTube first. So it's, it's really important for me that we keep doing that. We keep doing just really high quality and like truly free content out there. And then, of course, we have the commercial courses and commercial products for people who want to deep dig into that a lot more. And of course, we couldn't make a 20 hour course free on YouTube because then we wouldn't be able to continue to make making these free YouTube videos as well. So those courses really help to help to bring out like when people buy these courses, they also really help to produce more YouTube videos because then we yeah, we just have uh, we just have more resources to do that. Here's a question from Glitch Gremlin. Which brush alpha are you using? I don't think I have that one. No, you don't, because this alpha here is a secret one. This alpha here is one I made myself. So this is, um, you can see me sculpting more with this in the first stream, if you're interested in that. The, uh, it's it's from a, maybe an upcoming brush pack <laughs> from Flip Normals, we don't know yet. This is something that uh, I, I've been toying around just in my spare time and uh, just playing around with a few different kinds of brushes. And uh, this one I really enjoyed do using. So out of all the brushes I made, maybe I, I tried like maybe like six, seven different kinds of brushes, but with a bunch of different versions for each one of them. And this is the one I kept coming back to. So I started off with just like a loader, would load it in every single time. And uh, then I, I, I just started loading in as a default brush and I'm using it more than all the other brushes. It's a fantastic brush, really. It's not really available anywhere because, you know, it's uh, it might be, we might turn into a product, but um, yeah, I keep using this one. It has really good textures and uh, it's just good for building and removing volume. But yeah, let's see if we if we end up doing something with this one here. No promises as of this moment. Do a tier list software for sculpting. Okay. Quick tier list. This is going to be S, A, B, C. S tier is nothing because they're all weird. A is ZBrush. B is Nomad. C is nothing. D is Blender. This is my very informal, very quick ZBrush or sculpting list for a tier list for sculpting. Mudbox. Mm. 
Yeah, Mudbox is, is D tier as well. Mudbox. I can't spell today. Mudbox. Not sure if Mudbox or Blender should be in the same one. I'm going to move Mudbox up to C tier. Yeah, that's it. Oh, uh, Maya not found. Yeah, Maya is in the sculpting software, so <laughs> I would never, I would never include that there. Maya has like, sculpting features, but it's not in any way a sculpting software, so not going to include it there. And this was also no thinking whatsoever, so this was just my gut talking, which sometimes, interesting enough, is more accurate than when you start to analyze things. <laughs> Yeah, Blender just isn't a fantastic sculpting software. Blender is an adequate sculpting software in the sense that it's missing a lot of features and uh, a lot of the brushes aren't really particularly refined either and a lot of weird bugs in it. For instance, the first time you, you, you hit sculpt or you start to sculpt on something and you want to undo it, it takes ages to do. There is a lot of weird stuff there and it's not really being updated either. You can see this in like the version, version 4. Version 4 change log for that. It's not a lot of new stuff out there. And um, Pablo is who was the main driving driver behind that is long gone and is developing his own software. So that's also something to keep in mind as well. It, it's a perfectly adequate software for sculpting, but it's, it's not, I don't think it's a great software at all. And particularly not when you compare it to something dedicated like ZBrush. But yeah, it will, it will get the job done. For certain things, there are absolutely things it will not get a job done for. Like if you want to do like high frequency stuff, if I were to be at like the seven point something million polys now i would definitely have a hard time with that and particularly for dealing with alphas as well the alpha workflow is very awkward in in blender i mean it's, it's not even a comparable thing right it would be i mean which one is best for animation obviously blender is much better for animation than zbrush is because you can't really animate here so uh, it would it would be insane if blender were to be better at sculpting than zbrush would be like how would i Generic or general 3D software would be better than a specialist. That would be, that wouldn't make any sense. Yeah, Shen Yu is saying, I, I feel that the scope stuff in uh, in Blender just stalled without Pablo's influence. I mean, like 100%. I mean, that, that was what was driving it. I mean, he was literally the developer of it. And uh, there's barely been any updates in it. This is this is one of the things we, we've been talking about this on the stream before, and think on the podcast with when it comes to software that it's it's really easy to be too optimistic about software. Like for instance, you might be seeing a, a version of uh, of like your favorite software. Let's say it's Moto, right? Like they might be updating like crazy in a certain area, and based on the tech demos and such you're seeing, you're gonna be like, wow, if it keeps doing this for like three years it's going to be actually rivaling software x let's say the moto were to get like some kind of uh well like the blender right like with geometry nodes and you're seeing that it, it, it's progressing like crazy fast there and you and you're thinking that wow if this continues in like five years it's going to be the same level as houdini is currently yeah maybe maybe it is but but maybe it also shifts focus maybe the, maybe the development goes like well the geometry nodes are not good enough they're not like the best thing in the world in like two years or something, but they're they're good enough to do a lot of things. Now let's focus on something else again, right? It's really difficult to predict things, and I don't think you should be like optimistic about software in terms of in in that way. I've, I've been that before, <laughs> and uh, I think you should just use software for for where software is strong currently, not based on like promises or large way when it comes to Blender, not even like promises, but just like hype around it. I think you should just consider tools to be tools. I mean, I'm not a ZBrush fanboy at all. If there was a replacement for ZBrush, <laughs> I'll be using that tomorrow. <laughs> like, it's just a tool for me. I have no loyalty whatsoever to this. Like, if Nomad actually makes a desktop version and it's and it's solid, or or like a Substance Modeler becomes like actually really good, I mean, I'm I'm just gonna be using what I what I prefer to use. I mean, I've been using ZBrush since 2006 now, so that's. Uh, nearing almost 20 years so <laughs> i mean i have all that legacy in it and all that weird knowledge from it but i, I wouldn't care it, it's just it's just it's just a tool for me are there jobs in blender 
yeah, tons of tons of jobs which would be using Blender. Not necessarily that it would be studios that would be you that would be advertising that we are a Blender main studio, but it, there are tons of jobs that like just in games and freelance and our general general places that they allow you to use what tool you want. So uh, there are there are very few studios who use Blender as the main software, which unlike Maya and Houdini and such, right? But uh, I mean, it's it's definitely being used more and more and more. It, it ultimately it really comes down to are you really good or not, and then software becomes less relevant because you can always retrain that as well. Like if you're really good at using Blender, it's not going to take you a lot long, like not going to take a long time to learn Maya. I mean, if <laughs> let's say you get a job in Blender and or using Blender and uh, and and you need to learn Maya and you you have like two months until the job starts because you have to move country or like just just takes a bit of time well you can just learn it as fast as you can and by the time you're by the time you're starting you're probably going to be fairly up to speed and then a few weeks in a job you're going to be pretty productive so i i don't really think that's a major issues either either way tool tool or just tools no one no one how do you feel about 3d code don't really feel a lot about 3D code, to be honest. I know they had some weird religious things some years back that you couldn't use it to create blasphemy. That was a funny one. I think they might have removed that from the Turban service. That's like 10 years ago or something. But yeah, it seems like a perfectly, perfectly good tool for a lot of different things. It seems to be like a bit, almost a bit like a Swiss army knife that you can do all sorts of different things in it. But yeah, I haven't really seen a lot of cool updates from 3D code in a very long time. So I, I, I generally, I, I generally never really used it. I know Morton was doing it for a bit. But uh, yeah, not really something I've ever been using. Yeah, here's something that Adam is saying that, but Blender really struggles even on powerful machines. But Seabush feels like he's running on rainbows and unicorns. In 2007, I started high school, and then we were given a free laptop by the school, and uh, because Norway, I suppose. And I was running Seabush. Two, I think I was running Super Three. Super Three had just come out, and I was running that, and I would, the, the laptop was an absolute potato. I mean, it was it was a mid tier laptop from a two thousand five, and it was running Seabrush just fine. <laughs> so it just shows how what kind of stuff Seabrush can actually run on. So um, yeah, Seabrush Seabrush is just very 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 good with performance, and for sure, like performance is, is definitely one of its strengths compared to Blender. That's what I'm saying, right? Like the Blender, Blender and Seabrush, they're two completely different software when it comes to like high end stuff. If you need to like sculpt stuff once in a while, then then like something like Blender is is fantastic. Even like Mudbox, Mudbox has great performance though. But uh, if you just need to like sculpt up a cloth or something once in a while, or some rocks here, or just like you need to dent the prop or something, then Blender is fantastic because it's much, much, much easier to learn than than Seabrush. Like it, it's a whole different world. You can learn Blender, sculpting Blender in like five minutes if you already know the software. While Seabrush is just a weird cookie when it comes to to it, and that's what I find a lot of people struggle with if they are only using. If they're only sculpting once in a while, that a lot of people do. I'm a specialist, so I sculpt all the time. But a lot of people, they are, they're like generals, like asset artists, and they, they make all sorts of models. And a lot of them genuinely struggle with ZBrush because they use it once a month or something. <laughs> they're using it a few times a year, maybe like 10, 15, 20 times a year. And between it, or even less, between that, they keep forgetting how it works because it's not logical. They're going to be like, all right, cool, how do I save again? And they go like, all right, document save. And then their, their work is ruined. <laughs> so Seabrush is just weird when it comes to UX. But it's also by far the most powerful sculpting software uh, today. Like nothing comes close to it in terms of performance and customization and flexibility and features and such. A whole, whole, whole different world than anything else out there today. That's why we tolerate it because it's so powerful. How big is the difference when it comes to performance in regards to Maya versus Blender? That that depends so much on what it is you're trying to do, to be honest, because you have like like what kind of performance. It can be like viewport performance, rendering performance, uh, how fast is a render, how much how big scenes can you render? It can be like anim, rigging, 
general deformation. It can be sculpting. How high poly counts can you do? So it, it's really impossible to say. Like on in general, Maya is going to have better performance and has better tools for these kind of things, like with reference systems and proxy systems and just general better management systems for for scenes. Uh, like for instance, if you retopologizing, you have GPU caching. That means you can load in like obscenely large models. We're doing this in the. Uh, I'm talking about this in the Topogon 3 video, just because that also uses GPU caching. And like, I'm just amazed by the performance you can have there. And, and But that's also available in, in Maya. So yeah, the performance isn't like a, a single metric. It, it really it really just depends on, on what kind of thing you want to do. But since Maya is really like a product of enterprise production, they will just have focused a lot more on that. Just optimization, not saying that Maya is a perfect optimized software, but at least there's more focus on that. But yeah, it depends on what you want to do. Henning, do you have any tips on making nice quick CBRS renders? Yeah, kinda. What I, I tend to do is I tend to find a mat cap that's quite nice. Then I tend to find a light setup that's like fairly from the front like this. You can just go to light. You can also just drag this over here. Then I tend to go to render and I just go under shadow and I just choose angle and some rays here. And then I just tend to hit shift R and then <laughs> looks okay. Here we need more samples, right? So and here this will need more samples. Uh, and here's a cool tip, by the way. You see we've been dragging here on the bottom. It has a slider on top as well. Can't really see it that well because there's text. But you can see here there is actually, if you do race, you can see here there's going to be, uh, maybe not here. On this one here, at least you can see it. So if you drag on top, then you have like really fine control over it. But if you drag on the bottom, then you're dragging big, the big changes. So we can just change the angle here. And we change to something like this and we can change the global shadow strength. We can just do shift R and we can see what's going on. But yeah, the render engine in ZBrush is incredible. And like, not, not incredible, it's the opposite. It's incredibly basic, sometimes words. So I tend to just estimate my models and throw them into, into Blender. Like for, for rendering, I far prefer cycles over anything else. Like rendering this kind of stuff, for final rendering, I definitely prefer Arnold. But for rendering these kind of things here for like a for marketing or something, like cycles is like the best thing for this. It's so, so, so fast and so interactive and I can really play with it. So I just decimate it. I basically, I just go to, I just merge everything together. We're going to, where are we here? I merge, merge visible. And then I go to C plugin and then I go to decimation master, which is hidden here. Then I just hit one of these guys here. <laughs> Maybe I hit like 250. Then I just export, bring this into Blender and then we are just rendering. Morton is currently working on a really cool product as well called uh, Flipmos Lighting Scenes. We've uh, we had this out and it's currently out as well, but um, it's like an older version of it. So he was rebuilding that entirely. And then you can just drag and drop your model in there. and It's going to look amazing right away. And as a reminder, speaking of, we currently have 50% off on nearly all products on Flip Normal. Something like 30,000 products are currently on sale, which is which is awesome. We have tons of stuff on environmental art, real time, creating characters, creating quick alphas for things like this. I might actually show this kit off here a bit later on because this is a really cool kit for like creating very nice details here. Let me actually just show you this real quick. I'm just going to duplicate this guy because I don't want to destroy him because what I'm doing now is going to is premature. But I'm just going to show you this kit here. This is the face kit. Face kit and this is going to be here now. So this one here is awesome. So if you go to the light box, well, you have to move it here. Uh, the instructions in the download folder for that. Then face kit young and then we can just double click on this one here. It's pretty good. Double click here and then we just change this to see which doesn't crash now. There we go. Drag rect and then we can just start to move this out. So now we can just like start to, to drag out the pores and you can just start to see it really, really, really nice pores this way. It is still a pre bit premature in terms of the uh, in terms of the uh, poly count here, so I can subdivide this. Now, Zebra's going to complain a little bit, uh, and I have to actually increase this in my memory, where it's going to be here, and then max poly groups, max polygons per mesh, and then it's telling me that hey, this might be a little unstable. So <laughs> there is that. But now you can just see it here, you can just drag this out, and you get really good pores right away. 
so I, I use this a lot. It also it has a bunch of different pores as well with this. So I, I, I'll use this for like my own projects all the time. It has one for blow the eye as well. So if you really just want to like get some quick eye alphas out here, we can go to alpha. We can just like flip this horizontally. And I was going to work for this eye here. And oops, that was already correct. So we can just do this again. Flip horizontally, change the intensity. And you can just see how, how nice details we can get out right away. We also have the old alphas as well. I use this, this this for every single character I'm doing. It's they're so handy. We have like this stuff as well, the for nasal labial fold. And then we can go down like here and we can just like enhance this, really use this to like break up the surface. So we can just go in here and just like add this kind of stuff to like creases and crevices like this. I'll probably actually do this pretty soon on my guy and I'll show you how I'm, how I'm doing this because there is a technique to it as well. You can, of course, just blast it, which is great. <laughs> you can just go over right like this. Uh, let's find it. This one here, you can just like use a spray and go like and that's going to work. But um, if you really start to integrate them, you can see right how nice it actually looks. If you start to integrate it, it's going to look way nicer. So I'm going to delete this guy so that my autosave doesn't destroy me. And then we're going to go back to our dude. But yeah, you definitely want to be sure that this here is uh, it's a little bit more refined first, but for the hell of it, why not? Let's just go in here and I'm going to use the nasal label fold and I'm going to just going to show you my approach for this. It's not really premature to do like a pass of this because it allows you to break up the surface really nicely. And then you, put, you have to sculpt over it. That's a caveat with this. At this stage, you have to sculpt over because we're missing the mid frequency. If you, if you just start to go with this first, the resolution is too low, but also the, the mesh isn't there yet. But yeah, this is a very powerful way of working. This is where I, I regret doing the model without symmetry because then I could have just symmetrized and done this with symmetry, but I did not and I will deal with my consequences. What software will the lighting scenes be for? It will be for Arnold, for Maya and for Blender. So cycles and for for Eevee there. We previously had it for Moto and V-Ray and, and V-Ray for Max and such, but it becomes it becomes really tricky. It becomes tricky both from like a licensing point of view because we need licenses for everything, but also from like uh, in terms of like making sure that we can really do the best we can. Uh, we we really want to be sure that we are like pretty much experts at the software when what we're creating it for, so we can really make sure that it. That it's a, just a good version of it. So yeah, the lighting scenes are awesome. Like Morton's been doing a lot of cool tests with it. And first we've upgraded our skills a lot since we last made the lighting scenes. The original lighting scenes are from like 2015, 2016. And um, obviously we get better in that time. But also the software has got a lot better. Like for V-Ray, oh, sorry, for Blender, it was always annoying with lighting scenes because they... Uh, didn't support like we, we used light linking in when we made them for V-Ray, but uh, but Blender never had light linking until like version four just came out like a week ago now. So we we had to just we just had to make something that fit as well as it could. But uh, light linking is so important for these kind of things. You can check out our video on that. We also have a whole podcast episode discussing the. Uh, we actually go quite in depth in light linking as to why that's important. Is there any chance you guys will do an exhaustive tutorial on Topogon 3 or is YouTube video good enough? Honestly, the YouTube video is pretty solid. If anything, we probably wouldn't do an introduction to Topogon just because it's such a simple software, but we, we will probably we will probably do use software or tutorials that uses Topogon. But uh, yeah, the, the video on YouTube is honestly is honestly plenty. We don't cover every single feature, but also like in any software, you don't need every single feature. We're covering what you'll be using for the majority of the time. And um, then there are, I'm sure, additional features that we, we haven't been covering as well, but then you can always just look those up, right? But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's like about 35 minutes, 34 minutes or so, and it, it really covers most things, to be honest. It took a long while to prep for that video because we really had to be sure that that's a tricky thing when it comes to tutorials like that, because I, I you know, I was making that video and uh, you have to be sure that you both know how to use the tool, like from a, like a logical point of view, you need to know what the features are as well. But you also need to know, you also need to like get it into your fingers. You have to build muscle memory. So after I figured out the layout of it, or sorry, how the, how the software works and the interface and all that, I just sat for like a whole day or so and just retopologized just to prep for the video, just so it would become like like get ingrained in my fingers. Because that's the worst thing I know in, so in, 
in tutorials if the the teacher doesn't really know how to use the software they just like they're just one step ahead of the of the students in terms of the uh, the documentation so we really we really take that seriously really try to make make something that we we actually genuinely know how to use which takes ages to do <laughs> but particularly for tools like topogon or like my or max or something like that it's definitely worth it so now you can see i have a pretty good base to work from from here but i i definitely will have to uprest this as well like wait i have to go over and i have to sculpt this further because currently this is just not good enough so i'm using a lot of different alphas as well just to like get like nice directionality in it and just to break up the patterns Yeah, Polly is saying, yeah, I was using your lighting scenes a lot and it helped me so much. Really awesome products. And it's amazing that you're updating it. Yeah, it's going to be a cool one. I'm very excited about that. And thanks for, thank you for your kind words about the current one. It's um, we, We're using this all the time as well. Like whenever I've been doing like product renders and such, we've just been throwing it into lighting scenes. <laughs> That's one of, the, one of the things we're trying to do. We're trying to genuinely make products that we want to use ourselves in in like business there is there's so many like things about like how do you make the perfect product how do you make people want to buy your products and such and it's for us it's kind of simple we we just kind of make stuff that we would have either wanted in the past or stuff that we currently need and then we just like for lighting since for instance uh, we you know we might have been using like templates and such and it contains a few lights and that kind of stuff is just quite quite hand to have and they're like what if we just make it really good <laughs> and then when we make it really good turns out people are interested in that as well so i think that's kind of a not even a secret just kind of a way we're doing things that we just genuinely trying to use the products that we are that we're creating or it's like it's like i wish i knew this beforehand that's one of the, one of the reasons i'm so passionate about like skin shading <laughs> what well, we, we made a few we have like two videos on skin shading from last not too long ago on youtube and one of the reasons I'm really passionate about that is because skin shading for the longest time was something I didn't really understand. One of the reasons is just because it's bloody complicated because it's the skin, but also because the shaders are like, I've just kind of recently got good at that. So um, it's always been a tricky thing. So when I find something like that, I'm always trying to share that because I really wish past self knew all that stuff would have made my life a lot easier. Can I watch this tomorrow? It's midnight in my country. Yeah, absolutely. The um, all the streams we've, we've I think we've ever done uh, are available on our YouTube channel, so you can just check that out. Like the uh, yeah, it's all available there. After a long time watching your live streams, I used to. Um, watch you guys a lot before landing my first job thank you so much for all the good tutorials it helped to enter the 3d industry well thank you so much for watching i really appreciate that it's awesome to to hear to hear these kind of things because we we are just it, it's hard to it's hard to like properly connect with people watching the watching the tutorials and such when it's inherently an electronic thing like it's all digital right so kind of a definition you don't really meet people so it's awesome to do the streams and like actually like connect with with people like you just to hear here that it's actually made a difference. Like it mean generally means a lot to 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 me and Morton. Your camel challenge was awesome, by the way. So funny. Well, thank you so much. We we we'll probably do more of those. It's really fun to really fun to do those. Yeah, we did the horse one. Maybe I can even show that one. See if we can see if we can load in horse the abomination of horse we did, and. <laughs> Yeah, that was uh, some rough sculpts by us. <laughs> Where, um, yeah, at the end of it, oh, it hasn't loaded yet. It's it's on Dropbox and it hasn't uh, it hasn't. It's not an offline or it's online only. I'm gonna just load these guys, download these guys. Uh, we 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 made the whole thing, and then we realized that my audio, my videos had had messed up on on export. What we did is we imported. Um, uh, we were recording with OBS, both the both face and um, both face and um, and ZBrush at the same time, and then it worked perfectly fine on our test, and then massively messed up when we imported it or uh, when we when we actually exported it. So here we have two horses loading in 
right now. Here is one horse. Gonna just get Morton's as well. So, <laughs> here is Morton's horse. And here is my horse. And, uh, yeah, that was our horses. I, I think, I think the, um, I think the giraffe one was a better challenge because horses, we kind of know what they look like. Not perfectly in any way, but you know, you can kind of tell that this is my sculpt. This is where we're, I'm trying to sculpt the horse at least, <laughs> but with a, uh, with the giraffe, like my, my giraffe, oh, not my giraffe, camel. It really looked like the, uh, like the dog from Full Metal Alchemist at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was not great. But yeah, here is my horse and here is Morton's horse from the video May it rest in peace. So that wasn't great. Go back to this guy here now. Yeah, it's starting to come together a bit. Not crazy good yet, but it's it's starting to get there. And this is about how, how are we for time now? Maybe I spent two hours on the first one and two hours on the second one, and we are an hour and ten in, so that would mean that I'm five hours and ten minutes into this guy here. A little bit less, because it's not fully, it's not all super productive, but uh, yeah, but, but five hours in on this guy here. So this is about as far as I can take something in about five hours. With the caveat that we're almost a streaming and it's difficult to sculpt and <laughs> talk. It's not difficult for me to sculpt and talk at the same time. I've done this so much now, particularly during mentorship, but it's difficult to design and talk at the same time. It's almost like, for me, sculpting, if I just have something to look at, it's, it's just a very technical exercise now. Like, is this a, I've done this so much that it kind of is a second nature. But designing, that's just a different thing. That's almost like doing math. We really have to balance things up and figure things out, and I properly have to think. So in the first uh, video we did, like, Monday this week, yeah, Monday, uh, then um, you can... I'm not really looking at the chat at all. <laughs> now I am looking at chat because this stuff here is just... What I'm doing now is, is honestly quite easy for me to do because it's comfort zone like crazy, very deliberately comfort zone stuff. So, uh, yeah, it depends on what I'm doing in terms of how hard it is to do. Do you use Zebra Slayers? Seems like a whole new world there. Zebra Slayers are awesome and terrible at the same time. Zebra Slayers are great for certain things and they're really bad for a lot of different things. So I use them if I need to add something like, like fine frequency details. Like I might use this later on, but I find it to be highly frustrating to work with as well. So I, I use them sometimes, but my God, I try to not if I can avoid it. Yeah, so uh, the Furious TV's comments about like the whole the horse is like the the whole point about the the challenge was no reference, so that's why it looks the way it looks. If we were to have an hour and wind reference, it, it would look pretty decent, I think. It would look pretty much like a horse, but without reference, my god, that's a different challenge. It's a it's a very very hard challenge to scope anything without it, which is also genuinely interesting because it really shows the important also importance of reference and particularly good reference because. Like I'm, I'm, I was saying this in the video, in the giraffe, in the camel video. I don't, I don't think I made it into the. Maybe it made it into the edit. I generally can't remember. Where I run a half an hour mark, it's done. Like my, 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 my scope is done. I cannot take it further because I don't have any more information. So it doesn't really matter if I have like two hours more because the only thing I'll be doing, I'll just be polishing it. So at the end, it's going to look like some incredibly creepy thing that doesn't look like anything because it, it's just there's just no more info. Yeah, I have to put into it. So after like half an hour, you might as well just end it because at, after that, it's all polish. I'm kind of adding some things here and there, but it's based on nothing. So <laughs> spending twice as much time there to just like polish something is um, is something that a lot of people do, like including myself in the past as well, where you're just genuinely just wasting your time. And at that point, if you're just noodling around, you need to either just get new reference or you just need to like 
start something new, right? Or ch shake something up. Because if, if you're spending a lot of time and there's no change, like then spending an hour or two more is not going to do anything. Has Philip Normals made any tutorials for weapons gun art? Oh boy, have we. Well, let's check out the Black Friday sale for a second here. So let's check this out. Oh, while this one is loading, check out the Ben Erds tutorial. This is a Philip Normals exclusive as well. This is on creating a creating this character here from scratch. It's a very advanced video, which is or tutorial, which is it's like 22 hours, which is fantastic for people who want to to learn like really advanced things. Like it's not for beginners. But uh, yeah, this one's great. So uh, we can just look at this one. This is uh, Intro to Substance Painter, really focusing on everything you need to know about Substance Painter. Let's just see if this loads. There's a lot of people on the site at the moment, so it's unfortunately a little bit slow. But yeah, we have a whole masterclass for doing for doing uh, a weapon. So it's called, I think it's called Ultimate, Ultimate Weapons Masterclass. So you can search for that. There's also, a, again, a course taught by Emil Sliegers. Uh, and it, it's a very solid course. It uses 3D Studio Max and ZBrush to 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 really create a really cool, really cool rifle. Let's see if this one has loaded yet. Nope, it doesn't seem like it. And if you're hearing something, some rustling in the background, then that would just be my pet rats just uh, running around. So now you can see I'm just I'm just integrating the the alphas, just really going through and just integrating what's what's here, because uh, there's so much crap in the in the alphas. Not because the alphas are bad, they're not, but just because there's too much info in it. So just really going through and integrating what's there. I'm also going to try to remove brush strokes as well because brush strokes are while really cool, <laughs> are not really great at the end because people, as it turns out, don't have brush strokes. This brush here is a bit of a unique one though because it has a bit of a texture to it. So if, I, if I'm using this correctly, it kind of looks like skin textures. Name of pet rats. It's Momo and it's Echo and it's um, Milo. Two of them we just got two days ago. So they're still very fresh. They are seven weeks old and they're very, very tiny and very cuddly. They've just been, been sleeping on our shoulders and such for two days now. Very cute little guys. So when Morton is having having uh, an actual child, I'm having uh, I'm having rats, <laughs> and I'm very happy with that. Yeah, so you can just see that I'm just working up this. I'm just blocking this up, like so. I'm just working over the whole thing. I think something that's important as well to note if you're if you're watching this and you're and you're more of a beginner sculptor, intermediate sculptor, or just interested in sculpting, whenever you're watching people who have been sculpting for a very long time, do not try to match their speed. People sculpt at different speeds. Some people are slow. Some people are fast. And that is not something you should try to emulate. You should try to sculpt something well try to understand what you're sculpting. So slow, so sculpt slowly, methodically, try to have intention behind every single stroke you're putting down. And then you can start to do challenges to to refine it. Once, once you, you feel comfortable sculpting something to a good level, then I highly do recommend like speed sculpting. The advantage of speed sculpting is that you get to really test your, your methods. You get to really refine your workflows. But if you, if you try to like speed sculpt without knowing how to do something, you're just gonna, you're just gonna make something really crappy because it's then then you you don't really know what you're doing. Then you're just doing something really fast without it's uncontrolled. So the way I, I see it when it comes to sculpting speed is sculpt as fast as you can while you are in charge, while you are in control. And as fast as you can could mean really slowly. Or if you're if you feel like you're in control, sculpt as fast as you can while still in control, right? So it all depends on on uh, on your individual situation. Some people need to sculpt faster. Some people need to slow down. I definitely needed to slow down when I was, uh, yeah, when I was like more an intermediate uh, artist. I would, uh, I would over, I would, I would sculpt way too fast without thinking over what I was doing. I almost have like pride in how fast I was sculpting instead of 
having pride in the final result. <laughs> so stuff looked really rushed. A good way to think about it is try to have intention behind everything you're sculpting. Like what I'm doing now, for instance, I'm not just like randomly putting on lines. I'm very conscious of thinking about what I'm doing. I've just been doing it for, for some time, right? So that a lot of this kind of stuff becomes a bit second nature. It's kind of like if you learn to read. In the beginning, you're going to have to think about every single word. You have to enunciate everything and like really go over it. But then after a while, you're reading things without even thinking about it. Like if, you, if somebody were to put like three words in front of you now, you probably couldn't not read it because it's so instant. It's just like the brain just processes it. And it's a little bit like this as well. Once you've been doing this for some time, it just goes like fully into an automatic system, which is good and bad because it means that you, you might not think about what you're sculpting. But it's good in the sense that you... If you are thinking about what we were just calling at the same time and you have a good reference, then you can really make something really good pretty fast. Slow is fast, ending something. That's true. This is uh, one of the key things I have, I, like I kind of as a mantra when learning. It's uh, one, I kind of like almost solidified it when I was um, uh, like doing retopology tutorials, because particularly when doing retopology tutorials, then it really is about building down putting down solid foundations and if the foundation is there then retopo gets kind of fast what i mean by this is if you are trying to like do retopology right i'm just kind of drawing down some key lines here and these lines are just here and such then connecting this up isn't particularly difficult right then you can connect things up in interesting ways but if your foundation isn't this if your foundation is like you're, you're at this level here and you're always trying to just like do you want pulling on time and you're working in such a dense area and you do the same thing down here as well and you're trying to connect these two things up stuff is not going to connect so you're going to open like weird results but if you if you retope in a sense so that you're just starting to block in the main loops and such then uh, it becomes really manageable so uh, it's the same thing with sculpting you can see here in the first stream as well, if you're interested in this character, I highly recommend checking out the first stream because I do sculpt this guy from scratch and you can really see like how I'm working with this. Let me show you something I'm working on as well. This is um, it's a pretty cool little model that I'm currently working on. Here we go. So this is uh, this is an updated version of the Flip Normals Anatomy Bust. That, that's nearly all likelihood going to be just a free update to it. Let me find this as well. So let's find this one. So yeah, it definitely seems like we have a lot of traffic right now. It's probably peak time for the traffic for the site because now this is when America is waking up and Europe is very much awake as well. So uh, this might just take a little time, so I can return to that later on. But yeah, this is the Flip Norms Anatomy Bust. Let me show you the original version of this one that's currently live. It's just called Flip Norms Anatomy Bust if you want to see, if you want to see that one. So this is the um, this is the live one, and then this is the updated one. So the difference between these two is that this is available, this one is not. Uh, but I'm just separating out every single thing. So I'm separating out like the fat pads here, fat pads, the specifics of the, the mouth as well, fat pads, big muscles, big muscles, ears, all this kind of stuff. So this is the kind of stuff I'm, which really, really, really helps me. So when I've sculpted the, the, you can see how I'm working with this in the first stream where I'm, I'm just blocking it in based on this. And it looks terrible in the beginning, right? But then I'm starting to like add character design to it and such. So it becomes, it's a very powerful workflow. So yeah, I highly recommend checking that out if you if you are interested in that. So a lot of good uh, fundamentals in that. And let us sculpt a little bit on this side as well because this side is very neglected. Are you primarily are you primarily use Seawash or do you still use Maya? Oh yeah, I definitely use Maya as well. Uh, Seawash isn't a replacement for Maya. Maya is Maya is they complement each other very well. Uh, 
All right, so we've now been sculpting for an hour and 20 minutes and three minutes <laughs> on top of that. <laughs> you can sculpt the Maya. I thought it was mainly for creating 3D models. Yeah, you, you can't really sculpt the Maya. What you can do, you can kind of block in some stuff here and there and you can bash some stuff around, but you re it's really not a sculpting software. The sculpting software you want to use is ZBrush. <laughs> That's just by far the, the best one for that. It's just about using tools for what they're good at. Maya is great for rendering, for instance, because it has Arnold. It's perfectly adequate for retopology because it has uh, Quadro. It's great for UV mapping because it has the, well, the UV mapping tools that they acquired <laughs> some years ago. So, you know, it's good for good for certain things. Is it good for sculpting? Nope. Is it good for texture painting? Absolutely not. So, you know, just use tools for what they're, they're good at. And Maya is, is a very strong tool. Like I know there's a lot of hype about Blender at the moment and, you know, rightfully so, Blender is great, but I, I still use Maya a lot. I still prefer to model in Maya and um, I still prefer to even map and just generally create assets. I just find I have more control in, in the software and particularly for rendering, I really find that uh, the shaders just look better. I think the, the skin shading in particular, I just find that to be, just be, to be better than what Blender can do. But um, Blender is better for look dev because you have EV and it's real time in the viewport. So it's just, you know, stuff is just better for different things. But in that case, uh, for, for my real characters, I definitely prefer to um, to do them in uh, to do them in Maya because then I just want the best results I can have. But, you know, personal preference, right? Some people would, would argue with that and say that Blender is actually just fine for, for skin shading. I would say that it's not, but, you know, maybe there are some tips and tricks there that I can pick up. But uh, yeah, whatever works. For hard service modeling, would you choose Maya or ZBrush? Oh, it's Maya every time. I, I really don't use ZBrush for hard service modeling. For hard surface concepting, maybe, because then you can do some cool stuff. But for, for like modeling, I really don't. The reason is if, you, if you're doing stuff in in Maya, you, you get the topology at the same time. But if you're sculpting things, then you have to retopologize it as well. So you kind of have to do it twice. Depends on what you're doing, but... Um, but yeah, Maya is, Maya is honestly pretty good for hard surface modeling. Like it just has a mature modeling tool set there. Poly modeling is kind of poly modeling, right? Like who, who cares what you use in there? Like really all major 3D software can do poly modeling to a, to a really high level because this is like the, the thing that they were able to do since the very beginning. Some are better, some are worse. And there's definitely some personal preference there as well. Like one of the reasons I prefer Maya is because the, um, it's gonna sound like sound maybe a little weird to some people, but the interface, the general UX is is just quite comfortable. Let me actually show you what I, what I mean. Let me just load up Maya here. It's going to take like seven minutes because <laughs> Maya is very slow. The in... Oh, and pen pressure broke as well doing that. Great. So it's back. So in, in Blender, it's so hotkey based that you have to memorize so many things. You have to really memorize all the different hotkeys. And if you use it a lot, it gets really fast because that means you have hotkeys for everything. But what if you don't model in Blender every single day? What if you model in Blender once in a while? Well, you're just going to forget the general hotkeys because hotkeys is one of the first things you're going to be be forgetting unless you use it all the time and it's just in your fingers. I still have like 3 to max hotkeys in my fingers from like 2009, right? So some of those don't, don't go away. But if, you, if they never fully went in there in the first place, then uh, yeah, it's just going to it's just going to go away quite fast as well. Let's we see if Maya is opening. Yeah, Maya is opening, but uh, it's going to take a while. <laughs> that That's one of the things as well with, with Blender as well. Blender just opens much, 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 much faster. But at the end of the day, if you're sitting with the software every single day, if it takes like 10 seconds or a second or a minute to open it, it really doesn't matter because you're not going to open it that much. Come on, Maya. All right, here we go. Cool. So... Here we have my, I'm just going to switch your mouse now. So in, um, let's open Blender as well. Blender 4. So we can just talk about this real quick. So if you want to, I want to make a, um, a cube here now, perfectly default here. I'm just going to set this back to the default one here. You want to make a cube, shift right mouse button, cube. You can just do this, boom, there you go. What if you want to select some, what if you want to like split this in half? Just do this, boom. What if you want to split this in half? 
boom, 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 boom. And you just like use the marking menu. The thing is the marking menu is so fast, you literally can't see what I'm doing. I mean, in a very literal sense, it's not a frame rate thing. It's because it, it doesn't actually open the marking menu. If you want to like cut into this now, what you do, you just go boom and you have the, um, you have like the general tools. If you want to like have the multi-cut, you can just go in and you can just cut things through here. If you want to like bevel an edge, you can very easily do that. Just like boom, bevel and uh, you can just change the segments here. So this kind of stuff is just intuitive. Now, obviously I've been using this for, for a long time. I'm doing a lot of Maya modeling, but the point is just that even if you haven't used Maya for like a year, five years, like I know that Morton hasn't used Maya in a very long time. I'm sure he would still be able to go back to it fairly quickly just because the one thing you have to know is shift right mouse button. So no matter what you're using, shift right mouse button is the tool for that. And, um, for selection tools, it's going to be control right mouse button. So if you want to like convert this to here, control right mouse, mouse, mouse button, and then to edges and to edges, and you can convert this, boom, super easy. If you open a blender though, which you open up in a second. So, okay, so you want to you want to add a, a primitive here. For some reason, my navigation doesn't work. There we go, you want to add a primitive, shift A, all right, fine. It's just another button here. Then if you want to, uh, you want to bevel something, all right, now you can do this, control B, all right, fine not the end of the world. You want to extrude something, A. What do you want to insert something, or inset something? The I key. So already here, you have like a bunch of different, uh, a bunch of different hotkeys. And this isn't necessarily a huge problem because like this is just like a few, few keys and you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. But there are so many like modifiers to this. Like if you hit the E key now, you're going to see like, so I'm putting my finger now, right? But like look down here at how many, modifiers there are for this kind of stuff. So there are, there are so many modifiers for this. And you could, of course, use some of these ones here, but it's so inherently hotkey based that we, we had Andrew Price on for uh, for an episode many years ago for, um, we just interviewed him. And he, he kept talking about like Blender is like learn to play the piano. And that's just true. <laughs> like it really is like learn to play the piano because it's so hotkey based. Well, so if, for instance, right, if you hate hotkeys, some people just do not respond to hotkeys. They really, really, really don't like hotkeys. Now you want to bevel something. I don't even know where you find these kind of things, right? But let's say a bevel is probably under edge and then it's probably going to be a bevel here somewhere. There you go. So now you have to go edge and bevel, or you can like, you know, right click add to favorites and you do this and you click here. Or, you know, you just have to go through the menus here and there's so many menus. Well, if you hate this kind of stuff in Maya, you can just go up into the um, into the uh, the shelf here. So there are a lot of people who do this. They just go click, click. I generally don't know how to use the shelf because I never use the shelf, to be honest. I've been using it for like 13 years and I never use it. But it, it's just a different way of working where there are icons for it. You can just recognize things based on the icon and you don't have to go into a menu. Of course you can, this would be similar to going in here, but there are, there are icons for everything here as well. While there aren't icons for things here. So for me, like the UX is just fundamentally better in Maya because Blender really does force you to use hotkeys unless you are pushing hard back at that, like in terms of like the favorites, quick favorites, or, or you know, maybe you can make some custom interface to some degree, but my God, it's, it's a frustrating one. And that's why if, if I haven't used Maya in like a year, I've had this, right? If I haven't used Maya in actually a year and I open up again, and I'm just like, uh, I just like start modeling like a ninja right away because the uh, the tools are are so intuitive once you get used to them. Again, Maya is not like an insanely intuitive tool, uh, right? In many ways, it had ton, tons of UX issues as well, and it's clunky and it crashes and all that. But it, just because it has the marking menu workflow, it's it's actually very very intuitive for like asset creation. It's not about which tool is the best in terms of like. In an objective sense, is all what you prefer to use. If you think Blender is just the best tool out there, you know, use it. Go for it. Uh, nobody really cares. <laughs> just, just stick to what you prefer. I prefer to use Maya, and uh, and um, gonna stick to that. And um, you know, Blender is also great. I know how to model in both, so uh, they're they're both fantastic tools. But I think it's I think it's, it's interesting because so many people are just shitting on. Uh, on Maya as well, but like actually, it's it's still a fairly strong tool. It's not just a fairly strong tool; it's a very strong tool. Another thing here is you have menus for absolutely everything, or like settings for things, tools for things. It has so many weird esoteric tools that 
you can use for, for all sorts of stuff. So no matter what it is, you're probably going to have a tool for that or some kind of Mel script or Python script or something. And check this out. It's going to be a revolution here, but you can move things where you want them to go. You want cube one, I'm going to go down, just boom, <laughs> and you can do that. And you can group things. Ta -da! You can just take the whole thing and just move the group. You can duplicate the group, right? You can just do that. I know this is a bit of a different architecture thing in terms of how Blender works, but just the fact that you can do this and just move things around. This is the most basic thing I think is missing in it. You can just parent things. If you want to just move this, you can just boop, and you can just parent things across. So super intuitive for that. But that's enough about Blender and versus Maya, because ultimately it doesn't matter if you like to use Blender and um, it doesn't help. It, it would not even like using. If you if you are just a main Blender user and you and you know that you can move things in an arbitrary manner in the Outliner in Maya, it doesn't matter, right? Because <laughs> you can't port features. It doesn't matter if if you have like Eevee in in uh, Blender and you want that in Maya, you can't have it in Maya. So it's it's just about finding something you prefer. Do you think exercise still holds up? Nope, exercise is dead. Exercise would have probably been holding up to some degree, right? Even if it been if it hadn't been and killed off but I mean exercise fully dead exercise hasn't been updated for a very long time it was killed off in 2013 and uh, before that it wasn't like to pull all the resources into it so practically like were you talking you're talking about like probably 10 12 13 years since it's got any real updates if you even if you were to use it now like you can't I don't think you can find any legal ways of using exercise today because it's actually not a live software like they've taken it down and even if you were to, the render engine is Mental Ray, right? That's the one that ships with it. Mental Ray is the worst thing ever made and should never be used again. The implementation in XSI was probably the best of any of the software because it, it was Mental Ray was also in Max and Maya and it sucked in those software. But um, it was still Mental Ray. Mental Ray was still atrocious. So yeah, dead software and I miss it every day. <laughs> it's such a good, XSI was such a good software. Just reading the comments now. I have a question. That model are you going to retopo? Um, maybe? I don't actually know. Might do. I'm not actually sure if I am going to retop it. I generally don't know where I'm going to be taking this model here. I have the, the last version of XSI installed, 2014, I think. Yes, yeah, so if that's if that's XSI 2014, or it wouldn't would have been called Soft Dimash at that point because they rebranded from XSI to Soft Dimash. Soft Dimash was a company that owned XSI at that point. Then, uh, if it's 2014, that means that would be would have been out in 2013 because that was when it was discontinued. If anything, they might have just had like a grace period where they were doing bug fixes and such, just so that companies could uh, could port it over. But like, they, yeah, there was no development done after that. Like, that's one of the actual big tragedies of of, of the last ten years in terms of three D that that was that was killed off. First, it was acquired by Autodesk, and then they they just killed it off. I mean, it was it was a competitor. It was a legit competitor to Max and Maya. So if that was still around today. That would have and, and also this hadn't like either acquired or killed it off the, the uh, it might have been a different different industry today oh not fundamentally it was, still would have been kind of the same right but in terms of what software people would be using and some people are saying that oh autodesk should make it open source yeah but why would they it's not like a massive multinational company is uh, is you know, really cares about the software i think it's going to be in a graveyard I don't think anyone could acquire it either. Like, it's, I, I really think that XSI is just a dead software. And even if there, they were to, were somebody were to buy it and revitalize it, it's ten years behind the the competition. So, 
it's a lot of stuff you would have to update there. I mean, they're kind of doing that with Lightwave at the moment, where they're they're actually trying to revitalize it. So that's going to be curious to see. For me, that's a little bit silly to do because it's it's really far behind the competitor competition, and I don't really understand who will be using Lightwave today. But uh, yeah, that should be interesting to see. I mean, I'm all just for more competition. Competition is always good in in this field. And with XSI gone, there was less competition. So that was bad. A power Matt is saying, so after March 2015, my bad. Yeah, that could have been that the last version was what I was saying. That was like maybe came out like a year later or something uh, because there might have been patches or something to it. But yeah, there, were, there hasn't been any development on it since like for a very long time. <laughs> I'm still a Moto fan, especially modeling. Oh yeah, Moto is Moto is Moto is a great software. Moto was what one of my first real loves in 3D. <laughs> Back when everyone was using Moto or Maya and uh, and Max, Moto came out and uh, was just rocking modeling. It was originally just a modeling software, and modeling is still very strong. Then the founder took over, and they have, hasn't really kept up kept up to date with with the speed it used to have. It used to have a real community for it, uh, like around it, and then that community has just been been shattered now. Like the, it used to really be a strong one, and now it, it seems like that whole thing has moved to like Maya or just Blender. A lot of them have moved to Blender. The yeah, Moto is still a fantastic modeler. It has has a lot of really interesting ideas, and it's it's lightning fast for it. One of the reasons I actually went away from from Moto was because uh, the rendering. Rendering was really good initially when it came out. It had like a preview as well, like a render preview that was very very good. Because at that point, most software didn't have a preview, but then it just it was so complicated to use. Like in Arnold, for instance, you really don't have that many settings. Like the render settings here are just this. And this means that these are multiplied by themselves, multiplied with this, it's just very simple. So if high number means low noise, but high render time. So if you want low subsurface noise, you just go, boom, higher number. And then you can change it here. Well, in Moto, it was so complicated to the point that like I didn't really understand how the whole thing worked. Like it, 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 I had to look at tutorials every single time just to remove noise and flickering and that. So it was an advanced engine, but it was like, it was not, it seemed like it was advanced, a simple to use, but the moment you had to do any kind of troubleshooting, it just got very complicated. Just annoyingly complicated. And people made tutorials on how to use and such, but at some point I just didn't care. <laughs> I just want something where I can just, just one setting. And then I moved to, to Arnold and V-Ray. V-Ray was also great as well, because V-Ray, you, you can set it up so that it's basically just a single slider, so you control all the noise just through a single slider. That's what you need a lot of times when you're when you're just modeling or working with 3D. That is interesting, right? Every single time I post, like, uh, like this this render took this long, I post it on Twitter or something, somebody's being like, could do it in like one-tenth of the time. All right, cool, yeah, maybe. But... Then at first I would have to really, really, really start to get into the render engine. I understand it much better, like almost to a mathematical level. And I would have to spend so much time optimizing the, <laughs> the scene as well, or I could just hit render. And if it takes like 10 minutes or one minute, it really doesn't matter because you just kind of clean the house or something a little bit in the meantime. So if, you, if you're working as a pipeline TD for a movie, yeah, it matters. But if you're just working on your own things, just focus on what matters, which is not just the render time. It's, it's more, way more, does the render look good or not? Are you a fr freelance artist or full-time studio employee? Well, I think it's time to talk about our Black Friday sale because... I am neither. I'm working for a company I founded with my business partner, Morton. So we are, this is a marketplace. You can find tons of cool tutorials. This is the uh, product I was talking about before. This is the uh, Flip Norms Anatomy Bust. You can load this in, and this is what it looked like before. So I'll send a link to this. So yeah, this is what, this is my, this is my full-time job. Doing tutorials, doing the YouTubes, and um, yeah, just having a good time with this. Super easy. Just make, uh, just make tutorials and do the YouTubes. Easy. No issues with that. <laughs> Turns out running your own company, pretty difficult. It's a very different challenge than than working for a studio. It's not, not that working for a studio is easy. This is a very, very, very different challenge. So uh, it's really fun to do that as well. 
very challenging. Turns out building your own marketplace is not super easy, let me tell you. Particularly not when you have like 30,000 products and, and more. According to you, which software is best for rendering? All right, that's a good question, but it require you need some context for it because it good for rendering. There isn't really such a thing as just rendering because uh, we can talk about that for a bit. If you sometimes so some companies or some use cases you need to render, but you need it to be really, really, really fast. This would be like if you if you you have to render like like something that's supposed to be real time, like maybe even a game or like some kind of visualization that it's really important that people can move things around. And for that, you need like something like Unreal Engine, right? Or maybe like EV in Blender, where you, you just have like very, very real time feedback for it. But when you're doing that, you're also sacrificing a lot of quality because in order to do that, you have to do, you have to approximate a lot of things. You have to cheat in a lot of different ways. So if you, if you want the best result, the best visual result, you have to do a lot more computation because you have to simulate, like actually simulate light and like how light bounces and reacts, but also how it reacts to materials, reflections, subsurface, all that kind of stuff. So for that, you need just a very different kind of, of render engine that you need something like Arnold or Cycles or like RenderMan and such. So it really depends. And some software like, like Cycles, for instance, is great for, it, it looks really good, but if you want to just pump through a lot of a lot if you want to pump a lot of data through it like if let's say you're working in a vfx company or pixar or disney where you have like i don't know two thousand shots and the shots are very complicated then something like cycles is not gonna it's not gonna be good enough because it needs to just be rock solid and stable and it just needs to be, be built for that and that's something then you need something like render man or or arnold right for that for that purpose or you need something like what they're like what they have in Houdini as well. So it really depends. It's it's more like what do you prefer? Personally, I prefer Cycles and um, Arnold. Arnold, I think, looks better. I think the the shading, particularly the shading for for skin, just looks better there. I find that it's a bit more balanced. But uh, Cycles is also much faster. The GPU rendering is on a whole different level in Cycles than it is in. Uh, in Arnold as well, like GPU rendering Arnold still kind of sucks to be honest. It's not particularly stable and uh, keeps crashing on me. So yeah, but for so for like if if I'm doing like something that I want to look really good, let's see if I can find like some renders of this where I'm working on a project using Arnold for that. But if I want to do like quick illustrations or for product shots, for instance, I'm using a lot of cycles for that. So here is one. I'm gonna bring this guy up. This is this is Shrek. So this is something if you follow me on social media, you've probably seen this one. This is Shrek. And this is render in Arnold. And for this, I just want realism. Like this is not the greatest thing in the world, but it's fairly decent at this point. You can see how close up I can get, right, with these kind of things. So for this, I really like Arnold. I think the like the eyes here, for instance, there's also just the flip normals eye kit for the eyes. Uh, but this kind of stuff, it just works very well. The hair, I think, looks good. All the, the the kind of like the peach frost, that kind of stuff, I think it works pretty well. If I were to do this in Blender, it honestly, would look kind of similar. Like it wouldn't be like fundamentally different, but it's, um, it's, um, it's just a subtlety of it. I find that I have like like just worse skin shading. It's hard to put that into words, but I, I just find that the skin shading just isn't as good as it is in, in in Arnold. And also Arnold will just chug through everything. It might take some time to render it, and it would definitely be faster to do this in, uh, in cycles, particularly with, with GPU rendering. But I don't care if it's fast or not. I care if this looks good. So... Yeah, rendering is just a really complex topic because the best render engine for you, for you might be the worst render engine for somebody else. And then you also had what, what I talked about with Modo before, where the um, the render engine there was powerful, but it was too complicated for me to use. I really couldn't care about about learning a whole new engine like that in terms of like it, it was just technical. But a lot of uh, people who were doing visual or architectural visualization like Arcvis, they, they really liked it and they spent a lot of time on rendering and they knew it inside out. So it, it would be the same thing, right? If you if you want to use R, like RenderMan, RenderMan would have, have like a ton of settings and such. Then great if you're at Pixar or Disney, <laughs> but not great if you're just a person who wants to just 
render out a silly little cartoon, right? So, or cartoony character you've made. So yeah, it really just depends. There is absolutely no such thing as a best best engine. Same thing as there is no such thing as a best software. Just depends what you want to use it for. Oh, this is great. My ex-boss kept talking about how about Unreal Engine like it was his religion. He also asked me why we topologize by hand and why I'm not using a seer measure. Yeah. That's a tricky one. <laughs> Sometimes seer measuring is great. Like for this character here, just seer measure, boom, works well. But um but a lot of times you really don't want manual retopology. Gotta say though, for I think I just closed it, the Shrek one here. I'm gonna show another render now. This here, don't tell anyone, but uh, this here is all just seer meshed. This is without the peach for us actually. You can see yeah, seer is missing a frequency here. This is all just seer meshed. I really, really, really couldn't be bothered to retopologize him by hand because he's asymmetrical <laughs> like the I'm doing now. Can't really see it too well, but yeah, he's asymmetrical. So I just kind of did it. And can you tell? You cannot tell. There isn't a single artifact left from, and there isn't a single bad artifact from the seer meshing that would cause issues here. So then it works, right? Best and easy tricks for you un, for UV unwrapping. Have decent topology and then just select some seams for it and then hit unwrap. Use a good UV mapping tool for that that has a strong UV mapping algorithm for it, like good unfolding algorithm. Like some tools for like this would be, for instance, um, UV master in ZBrush, which is right here. Use existing seams. This is a great way of doing it. And you can, like also Maya has good tools for that. RISM as well. Good tools for just core unfolding. Like it, unfolding is honestly quite simple. You just select the seams and then you hit unfold and uh, you get uh, a nice unfolded version. Keep iterating until you find um, you find that you get the correct amount of stretching for you. The correct amount of stretching just depends on what you're doing as well. What do you think of a Marmoset tool bag? It's awesome. I haven't used it too much, to be honest. I've used it a bit here and there, but it looks it looks fantastic. It looks like a very good tool. I find that having not been in games, the games were <laughs> getting all the cool tools. In film, you had... A film is honestly so similar today to how it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, Arnold existed... Mari existed and uh, Seabrush existed. Seabrush 10 years ago to today is very similar. Maya existed. So if you were to like throw somebody from 10 years ago in like a film artist from 10 years ago where I was almost a film back then, I started in 2014, uh, into today, they would be like, all right, cool, now I have to pick it up. <laughs> but in games, there's so many cool tools. Like, I mean, film is using more Substance Painter now, but you know, it's a still a fairly recent addition with Udems. Couldn't do that before, not really a lot. And uh, games has so much cool stuff happening with um, with real-time game engines and uh, mega scans and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I was always very jealous of that. Even just like, um, like Marmoset. I mean, it makes sense as well because games is so much bigger as an industry than, than film. Like it's it's much 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 bigger. Games is games is bigger than music and film combined. <laughs> so games is massive. If I was building tools, I would probably be focusing on on games as well. Like take a company like the Foundry for instance. Compare that with something like Epic. It's tiny. Epic is so much bigger. Any advice from Maya on Blender? Is Maya still a must if you know Blender? Depends what you want to do. Uh, it's not a must by definition. If you if you want to get a job and the job you want to get is dominated by Maya, then it's very, very useful to know Maya. In my background and Morton's background as well in, in the film industry, particularly in London, but just globally as well, it's all Maya. Like it's Maya is the main tool you're using for that, but it also depends on the position because if you want to be a modeler, yeah, it's going to be Maya. 
But if you want to be an effects artist, you know, learn Houdini. If you want to be a lighter, it doesn't really matter because then you're going to be using proprietary tools to some degree. You're going to be using Katana. that can be difficult to set up at home. You might be using Houdini for lighting with a, maybe a proprietary render engine or, you know, it doesn't really matter that much what software you're using. But if you, if you want to be a rigger or an animator, it's definitely, definitely still Maya being used. Modeling, definitely Maya. One thing is kind of interesting. We have been talking about this before, but this is worth repeating, I think. So many people are saying that in modeling, modeling is modeling and a polygon is a polygon. So it doesn't really matter where your model uh, is made. And to some degree, that's true. Because yes, if you were to build a model in, in Blender, you can easily import that into Maya. But what if we have a model here in Maya? Beautiful model right here. And what if there are some some tags associated with this or what if we have what if you have this model here right and there are blend shapes on this model and there are tons of these blend shapes here and they're just uh, they're just connected to the um to this and you know we just enable the blend shape here and you know it, it all here and then we just connect this and this is all set up so this stuff here is live a right, cool what if what if you want to modify this? What if you want to make the blend shapes in, in Blender or you want to do something else to it? You could technically do it, but this this already has a network associated with it now. It has an input here. So now in this simple case, you would have to export it out, you would have to break the connection and you have to re-import it. That's just going to take some time or you can just do it like here. And this is a simple case. What if it's a very advanced case? What if it's something that has not just one UV set that it would have here, but what if this has a crazy amount of UV sets. What if this has just a bunch of different ones? Then this becomes a lot harder. What if there are just like, you can't really necessarily have it here, but in every production you might have like, uh, it might be like an extra attribute here. So this might be at NPC, they call them like prim bars. And some people just places just call them tags. And it might be saying something like add render time, subdivide the model or do something to the model at this point. And um, then you're, you're kind of in trouble because then you can't really just import something in because it's an existing network. It's um, There is already a system for it. Now you're breaking the system. Uh, another one here while we're at it is you might have a lot of love. Um, you might have a lot of like image plane set up. So if you have image planes for, for things like that it, and it's set up in one software, even if like if the main software is Blender and you want to use Maya, well, it doesn't matter. It's still set up here. Yes, of course, you could make a camera here and you could, you know, have an image plane for this and you could just import and export this, but you need tools for that. And you also have what I called the mystery variable. And the mystery variable is what happens when you do something like this. If you were to, to like what happens when I try to to like move this model up here. Well, it's going to move up here, easy peasy. What happens if I export this into Blender? I modify it there and I import it back in. Is this going to work? Probably, but there is a bit of a mystery to it. There is some level of unpredictability to it. Maybe the plugin for this kind of stuff is a bit busted in, in Maya or in Blender, or you just don't have to correct export settings. So every single time you do something like that, and the more complicated it gets, the more of a mystery it gets, the more uncontrollable it becomes. So this is where like just a model, modeling isn't just modeling. And this is something that is fundamentally compatible, right? Modeling is just, it is just polygons at the end of the day, but you have a lot of pipeline specific things. What if it's an animation or a rig or something that's fundamentally incompatible? Stuff just, stuff just gets complicated saw this in production sometimes there were some people who want to use like non-standard tools some people want to use moto for instance i was a moto artist but i just moved to maya because it was fine but some people want to keep using moto and it was a problem because they they uh, nobody could take over the work if they were sick or it was issues with licenses because everyone was on one software but now they had to get licenses for a whole different one you can't get bulk licenses for that it's just a bit of a nightmare so yeah it's a lot more complicated than just like it's compatible because yes, on the surface stuff is compatible, but the moment you start to dig a bit more deeper into it, it might not be. That was my little rant about this for now. Do you think the industry will recover anytime soon? Well, it depends on the industry. The the games is a tricky one because that that's we have a whole podcast about this as well. You can check out. That's in large part down, down to like large macroeconomic factors. 
film is down because there were strikes. So the moment the, the strikes the strikes are now over, right? So the um, that should hopefully start to recover, but it's going to take some time. It might take six months, right? Because well, if the writers are striking for a while, they have to start writing again and they have to start publishing things and they have to get new deals with the companies and everything. And then the work has to start and they have to shoot stuff. It just There is just a delay in the process. So just because the writers are done doesn't mean that everything starts up again. But, you know, there might be things that are all written in the pipeline that just stop that they can kind of start to pick up, but um, difficult to say. Hopefully it picks up within a few months, right? Just at least starts to pick up some steam. But yeah, difficult to say. I really hope so, because these strikes have brought a lot of pain onto a lot of people. Not anti-strike or anything like that, but Jesus Christ, there, are, there is a consequence to that. Like a lot of my friends have, have lost their jobs because of that. There's a lot of people who are very anxious about it. Even like, it's not just people who are in like well-paying jobs and can afford some buffer. The big large problem with that is if you are, you're on a visa, for instance, that's one of the things we talked about in the in the video about the industry. Like, okay, what if you, you lost your jobs? What do you do? First thing, check your visa because you might be kicked out of the country, right? If you're in the UK or US and you, you lose, or Canada, I suppose, right? Like countries that a lot of people are working working in with a visa and you lose your, your job, like then you might just be kicked out. And if nobody's hiring, it's very hard to to stay to stay employed. So yeah, it, it's, it's brought a lot of pain onto a lot of people. I just have to say this now. You are fantastic at sculpting. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I really enjoy sculpting, so <laughs> that's good to hear. Here's interesting one by Spicy Chili. Uh, you mentioned that you rendered Shrek in Arnold. I'm curious if you to know if you used Unreal, if you would have gotten the same result but faster. Probably not. Like now, I'm not an Unreal artist, but I can't imagine that it would be faster. One of the reasons it looks as good as it looks at Arnold is because there was a lot of computation done for that. I, I'm very curious to learn Unreal, and I really want to get into that. But this is one of those areas that Arnold is actually really good at. So it would definitely be faster in Unreal, but it, it probably wouldn't look better in Unreal. Uh, one thing as well is that in the last render as well, or well, in the close-up render, the first render I showed you guys, uh, there is a lot of peach fuss. I'm not sure if you can see that in the stream, but there's a lot of peach fuss on that. And that would be something that I think Unreal would have a much harder time with because it's you would have to maybe do some, some cards or something like that. But in, in Arnold, it's it's like real, it's real hair. So it's it's like it has a proper hair shader on it and all that so i don't think it would be better in unreal it would most certainly be faster though but also keep in mind i haven't optimized it at all in terms of the render time or or like the asset right it's just a it's just a, a model which is zero meshed <laughs> which is like in a very bootleg manner uv mapped and displacement maps on it and then texture painted in uh, in painter so yeah it's not optimized in any way and I don't care because I'm doing stuff for myself. <laughs> but I might turn it into a full tutorial as well. We have been talking about that because we have the, speaking of, we have a sale on a bunch of different things now. And let's see if I can find the one I was wanting to talk about now. Because we made, I made a course last year called uh, Realistic Character Portrait Masterclass. That's showing how to do, let's see if I can find it. Uh, that's showing how to do um, a fairly realistic looking character. In, in Blender and Painter and Seabrush, the uh, this one here, the um, and and you know this is a perfectly legit way of doing it because there is hair as well and not nose hair and all that, but um, I want to show this in um in a, just a different workflow. It result will probably be the same, right? But uh, I want to show how to take Shrek through this workflow, sculpting in Seabrush, texture painting in Mari, not in uh, Painter, and then using XGen and Maya for the. Uh, for the, the asset itself. So that would just look a bit different. We'll probably be around a 25 hour tutorial and that will be out. Well, first I have to start it. <laughs> mm. 
comment. Uh, I love the camel from memory challenge. Really looking forward to seeing what everyone shares. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> that was a really fun one to do. We did that two days ago, I think. Yeah, two days ago. And first we, like we mentioned in the video, we made the horses. You can see right here. <laughs> Beautiful horses. <laughs> I think the um, I think the camels are funnier because camels are just funnier animals than horses. Horses also people kind of have an idea what they look like. Not us apparently, but you know, at least it kind of looks like a horse. <laughs> But for uh, for camels, I mean, who on earth knows what that looks like? My girlfriend is still making fun of me for not having any idea what a horse looks like. Which, you know, is, is fair. Or what a camel looks like. But on the, other, on the other hand, how would I know? I think it's a cool cool idea because it shows that, you know, we, we, we've we been professional character artists and we, we're still doing professional character art in terms of like the tutorials and such. And we sculpted something that looked much more for like a beginner sculpt because we didn't have reference. How are you able to texture in Substance Paintable to render on Arnold? You just export out the texture maps and then you, you just apply them in in um, in Viri, or in Arnold, in Maya. Let me see if I can just open up the scene for that. I'm just gonna open, do this on the second monitor here. Come on, Windows, your stupid things. There we go. So let's just see if we can bring this up. First, I have to set the project. <laughs> really important, because otherwise Maya is going to complain. Now we set the project. <laughs> Actually, I'm not going to do this now. I can look at this another time, but right now I want to uh, just focus on this one. Is animal anatomy more difficult? It's not inherently more difficult because anatomy is kind of anatomy. What you have is you have origin assertions for muscles. You have um, different bones and all that. It's just different. The what What's more difficult about animal anatomy is that we are more intimately familiar with human anatomy because we see it all the time. We can use ourselves as reference and... Also, the, obviously, the materials, the anatomy, the anatomical resources are much, much, much better for humans than they are for animals. But yeah, it's not inherently more difficult for for animals than humans. Also, because animals are humans are just animals, so there is a significant amount of overlap. You can look up like comparative anatomy for this. So, if you know how a human arm works, and um, we can know how a human skeleton works, you can, in with some reference, just figure out how to make a cat or a dinosaur or a lot of other things because there's so many similarities but yeah it's all hard <laughs> like human anatomy is just hard and that reminds me of another tutorial which i want to just briefly talk about we have this one here this is fantastic by christian bull and then we have introduction to anatomy so if you're interested in in anatomy we came out with this like in August, I think. This is Introduction to Anatomy, where we, we cover how to sculpt this guy here from scratch. Just, well, from a base mesh, very, very loose base mesh. Cover all this, but then we also just cover basically everything you kind of need to know about anatomy. This is what I was hoping to, hey, this is my hand, my very tiny fingered hand. <laughs> this is uh, the course I wish I had when I was learning anatomy, because this stuff here is just really difficult to combine, uh, combine otherwise, because it's just really hard. So I recommend first intro to anatomy and then fundamental anatomy for sculptors. These two are really solid. Uh, take If you first take the intro to anatomy, then you'll learn the muscle names and you'll learn all that. And then for the fundamentals anatomy, then you'll learn how to like create something that looks realistic, how, to feels, how it feels real, which is really, really important. And these are of course 50% off during our Black Friday sale. I also hope that all the uh, all the Americans watching had a really good thanks Thanksgiving. Hope you got to spend a lot of good time with your family and it didn't get too violent or too political. <laughs> hope you just had a genuinely good time. I know there's been a lot of turbulent years now, so genuinely hope that you you're able to just have a good time. Oh, this is an interesting one. But can you talk about learning how to learn? Oh yeah. 
that's my jam. So in order to learn, you need three things. Let me just try to not throw my water bottle on the floor this time. So you need three things. First thing you need is you need quality instructions. So quality instructions, quality, there we go. So this just means you need either a good tutorial, a good book, or somebody just to tell you this is how you do it. If you don't have quality instructions, everything is just going to be poisoned, right? Like I've, without this, you, you have no idea where to go. This would be like if you try to sculpt in ZBrush, they would tell you a sculpt in Blender with a mouse. Like th this is just not the way to do it. Or quality instructions would be start off with Dynamesh, start off with simple brushes. And this is how you think about anatomy, right? Like good quality instructions. Number two is you need practice. I cannot type. That is something you guys will have to deal with. Practice. I'll type right, if there only was a way to say that. So you need practice. You just need a lot of practice. This is what I just refer to as mileage. You just need a lot of mileage. This is like if you're driving a car, you just have to drive this car a lot for this to become truly intuitive. And if you don't have practice, the quality instructions, they don't matter. So it's really, 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 really important to practice a lot. But practicing by itself does nothing. Like then you're just going to practice aimlessly. If you just give somebody ZBrush and just tell them to practice, they're just going to waste their time. So it's really important to have quality instructions first and then you practice. So this here is kind of like like you're going on a ship, imagine you're like 300 years ago, and you need to just navigate to some place. It's, um, it's a sailboat. So first you need just quality instructions telling you where do you want to go? Like, how do you operate the boat? And how do you, like, what is the direction you want to go in? And then you have practice, meaning that you know how to operate the boat consistently, you know how to use the boat and all that. And you can be, you can be taken there. But the third one, is feedback because even if you know how to operate the boat and you had an initial strong direction you are going to mess it up because this stuff is difficult and this is equivalent to if you with the boat metaphor that you know how to adjust the course this is where if you're going like from this land here to like this land here you just have to be sure that Initially, you're starting off here, quality instructions and all that. You practice, you know how to do that. But then once you, you come up here, you just have to be like, all right, change of course. And you just have to go here. Feedback. Feedback is so, so, so important. So in a very real sense, when it comes to not using naval metaphors from the 16th century, quality instructions is a good tutorial teaching you how to use ZBrush, for instance, or how to sculpt. This would could, for instance, be introduction to ZBrush or introduction to sculpting, introduction to anatomy. You just get information that is of high quality that's been distilled for you. It's not just a book that teaches you every single thing or a tutorial that covers absolutely everything, every single thing you need to know. It's a series of steps that are useful to you. Practice means that you're just sculpting a lot. You read apologize and texture painting a lot. You're just doing it a lot. And there is no substitute for this. You, this is the time, this is where you should spend by far the most amount of time. You need practice. So, so, so important because this is where you're developing muscle memory. This is where you learn to experiment with things. And this is where become, stuff becomes intuitive. And then feedback as well. If you're just doing these two things, then you're, you're, you're not really, you can improve a lot, but it's going to be really slow. Once you get feedback on things, this is where we're doing it. We see this very clearly in the camel video, right? Where my legs are like, uh, they're like down here. We have a little foot here, wearing shoes. And then we have on the other side, we have like legs right here and then going the other way, right? But the distance here is, is wrong. Feedback means that we know that, well, the distance should be this, right? This should be a distance. This is feedback. And this means that we can just keep learning from this. We can keep refining our sculpts. And if you have all three, you're going to learn real fast. <laughs> it's really difficult because you have to be consistent and you have to, you have to just be open to feedback, but quality instructions, mileage, feedback. This is my way of learning. And it's not really about, it's not really about like necessarily like 10,000 hours or so, because that just depends on like what you're learning, right? And and who's learning, it depends so much. But you just need a lot of time. 10,000 hours is kind of like a metaphor for practice a crap ton, right? 
If you go back earlier in the stream as well, you can see me talking about this stuff here, about how to sculpt a skull, how this is a fantastic way of working. So you can just go back to, I don't know, half an hour mark or something. And um, we're just specifically talking about this exercise. This is where we're, we're utilizing quality instructions, feedback, and then um, and mileage. Yeah, so this is this is in a large way about like deliberate practice. The way I see it is, failure kind of sucks. <laughs> like if you're if you're failing over and over again, over again, there is no there is no guarantee whatsoever that you will learn from your mistakes. You can, but there is no automatic way. So if you just were to sculpt a lot, and when you're sculpting, you're failing, right? It, it's difficult to do it. Then there's no guarantee whatsoever that you will actually learn from it. But if you're deliberate about it, like if you're putting yourself up for failure in the sense of the skull exercise we talked about way earlier in, in the stream, then you're kind of putting in a fail safe for it. Same with the camel thing, or if we're looking, we're sculpting with a reference and then we're looking at reference and then we, we're kind of deliberately failing. It's kind of like deliberately practicing. And I think that's so, so, so important. You should, you need to fail in order to learn to some degree, of course, but it should be like productive failing. It should not just be destructive failing. Destructive failure would be you're trying to learn a, a new skill and you're, or you're trying to build a portfolio and you just go for it. You just right away, first year of university, you're just like, all right, cool. I'm just going to build this epic piece. It's going to take me six months to do. The problem is, is you're, you aren't there yet. It's like trying to run a marathon and you're, you're not in any kind of shape. You're just going to fail. And what did you learn? Well, you learned that you can't run a marathon if you're not in shape. Right, so then it's much better to properly prepare for that. Basically, my position is kind of don't be stupid about it because there is a consequence to that. If you're trying to run a marathon and you're not in any shape, it's not just like, oh, you're fine. You might have like, you might actually get like issues with your legs or knees or something because you're running for such a long time. You might really push yourself. I met somebody the other day who was basically on crutches because he'd been running wrong for some time. I met a lot of CG artists who has issues with their elbows and knees and shoulders, including myself, because we've been sculpting in a wrong way or too much and all that. So it, for me, it's really about being deliberate about about how you practice and how you work and not just like, oh, embracing failure. Failure is all good. No, it's, it's, about, it's about what can you learn from it. The, the, this answer is going to sound a little bit stupid, but the question is, how can I learn hard surf topology for hard surface? In a large way, you just have to model a lot. You just have to model a lot, and then you just have to like analyze what um, what the asset is going to be like. For hard surface topology, same for anything, right? But particularly for hard surface topology, it's going to depend so much on what the final output is for. If you're modeling for, for games, Hard, a hard surface model is very, very different than if you're modeling for for film, for instance. Like just because you, you're dealing with like normals and all that kind of stuff, and you don't you don't really do that for film, then you're dealing with subdivisions. So it really depends on what it is you're doing. Uh, amazing topology for film would be very bad topology for games, and vice versa. If you if a game modeler were to just throw their models like a perfect model from The Last of Us or something into a film. It's, it wouldn't be a good model. It, it wouldn't be, you would have to basically redo it. And if you were to throw an amazing prop from a movie into The Last of Us, same thing. It would look great and it would be terrible because it's not optimized in any way. Fundamentally, there are a lot of same same skills for, for both things, of course. And, um, you know, modeling is kind of modeling, but you need to you need to know how to, what you're optimizing for. Same thing with rendering, right? Or texturing. Uh, like the UV maps for my characters, like for Shrek, I was showing before, it's not particularly well optimized, but who cares? Like if it takes, same with like the texture space as well, if it takes me a minute to render, or if it takes me a minute and 10 seconds to render, really, truly does not matter for me. Or if it takes a minute or two minutes, it really doesn't matter to me. But if, you're, if your game runs at 60 or 29 FPS, obviously that matters, right? I like retopology and UV mapping. I guess I'm weird. I like those too. 
I, I, I strangely enjoyed doing them. Uh, for, for this asset though, the reason for the, the Shrek one, for instance, I was showing before, and the reason I didn't do it is not because I didn't, it wasn't like I didn't like it, it was because I like texture painting more. So I want to get to texture painting a lot a lot earlier than the uh, than I than I would otherwise. But if it hadn't been, if it had been a symmetrical asset, I probably would have done topology for him because honestly I've been doing topology for such a long time that doing topology for Shrek would probably take me a, just north of an hour to do maybe like an hour and a half but he's asymmetrical and I can't be bothered to do that like because I sculpted him without symmetry same as this guy here right like this is sculpted in a large way without symmetry and I don't care about <laughs> doing topology for both sides or doing it for one side merging it over and all that I'm just gonna auto like auto you auto topologize it right but it's not for a portfolio. This is not for any kind of portfolio. This is for this is for me. So if people don't like my, my topology, I can just go, all right, cool, that's fine. If this was for a portfolio and I was applying for Naughty Dog and they were like, I don't like your topology, they wouldn't give me the job, <laughs> right? So there isn't for me, there isn't a consequence on having like auto topology here, but there would be if it was for a portfolio. Like if this was for a portfolio and I highly recommend you show breakdowns in your portfolio and they see, see your mesh topology, they would go like, hmm, but why? That would show that you, they that probably you wouldn't know how to do it properly. And then like a, a large part of, of making games or movies or anything like that is just, just being a technically so, like technically sound artist. Just knowing that this is what Mort and I have been calling Seabrush Cowboys. We saw this a lot when we when we were in film. There was a lot of Seabrush Cowboys or people people who were Seabrush Cowboys who tried to get into the industry. And they could operate zebras really well, but they couldn't actually uh, they couldn't actually do fancy things. And that's just what you need to do a lot of times. You just need to be able to transfer blend shapes between models or UV map things and, and do technical things to assets. So many wise words from Henning. I really like listening to you while I'm retoping my character. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. If you if you like my little ramblings, <laughs> then <laughs> Check out our podcast as well. This is, um, this is something we've been starting now recently. You guys might have seen this, but um, you know, on YouTube, there are a fair bit of ads at the moment. <laughs> Can't really change too much about that. That's YouTube. But uh, on podcasts, there, we don't have any ads at the moment. So there, there's nothing there. So you can listen to those are completely ad-free. So they're available like on Spotify and basically everywhere else as well. So uh, yeah, that's like proper long form content. That's what we're trying to do. Because I personally don't really like short form content. I really like long form because if I'm like, I don't know, playing Elden Ring or <laughs> going for a long walk in the city or something like that, I, I just like listening to long form content. And um, that's what we're trying to do. Ironically, long form content takes way less time than short form content because then we, we prep beforehand and then we we come with some notes, but we, we try to make it more of a conversation. We try to not make it too edited because we, we just want it to be like a human conversation instead of just information exchange, which if you listen to like some podcast by like The Guardian or The Economist or something, you know, totally fine. They're like news organizations. Then it's just what happened here or this happened here. All right, cool. But we're way more interested in like the more human connection of that because that's what we like. We just like talking together about cool things. So yeah, so just check it out. You can just you can find the, the podcast on I think pretty much all podcast services. You, you just search for Flip Normals. I think it's just called the Flip Normals podcast, but there's nothing not gonna be anything else for Flip Normals, so you can find us there. What's your take on N-Gons? Uh, my take on N-Gons is that if you know how to use them, they're totally fine. That's a big if, because if you try to put them into Seabrush, for instance, Seabrush is gonna go like, hey buddy, can't do that. And then it's going to convert to a triangle and then you're in trouble because now the topology you have in Seabrush and Maya aren't really the same. And um, that's an issue. And um, so you just want to be, ch be in charge of that. And if anyone wants to see something really cute, here we have a little boy. <laughs> this is a guy who we picked up yesterday. This is Echo. He is a very small little pet <laughs> who I love very much. And he's a very gentle little guy who loves to sit in my hand. And maybe he can just be on my shoulder for a little bit. <laughs> and here we have another rascal who is uh, not so much of a shoulder rat. <laughs> so my girlfriend will just take these guys. <laughs> so yeah, we got two guys yesterday. Echo and Milo. Lovely little guys. 
Yeah, I love to cuddle. Speaking of N-Guns, <laughs> so yeah, so with N-Guns, Seabrush straight up doesn't uh, like 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 N-Guns. Like it, it's not like a preference thing. It's like it's a le- it's illegal topology. But um, if if you use it for hard surface and use it correctly, meaning that you you cleared it with whatever lead you have or whatever pipeline you have, then whatever they're fine. You should check out Jordan Kane on Twitter because he is a madman when it comes to N-Guns. He's basically the <laughs> the uh, the N-Guns spokesman, the spokesperson for N-Guns. For me, I don't really do too much hard surface. I, I don't really care. <laughs> like use whatever you want to use, but it, it for, it's the same thing with triangles or quads or anything like that. Or really, zoom out is about what is good topology. That's something more than I should really do another, another video on. Good topology is just whatever whatever works. If N-Guns work, then awesome. And um, nice to see comments about the little rats. <laughs> they're very cute. <laughs> yeah, they're they're tiny. We have another rat as well. He's about a year and a half old, and he's so large. That guy is about the size of my forearm. So he's about like this size here. And uh, the uh, these guys here are the size of my finger. <laughs> Name some old movies with the effects at age well. Jurassic Park. I guess not gonna say old, but maybe old, but like Pirates of Caribbean, the second Pirates of Caribbean. Amazing. Amazing. Now in this case I'm defining visual effects as 3D, not just like crazy cool optical tricks as well. That's you could I, you could kind of call that VFX as well if you're doing some cool stuff on top. But yeah, Jurassic Park and uh, Pirates. Gollum as well. I mean, that, you know, then you are getting into like like the um, uh, the uh, first Lord of Rings is like 22 years old now. So, you know, that's pretty old school for that. Two, uh, 2002, you have two towers. That's where Gollum is really getting into getting his screen time. So uh, that stuff looks amazing. Have you tried sculpting Echo? Echo would be a little rat. I have not, but maybe one day. No, they're adorable little guys. Rats have such an undeserved bad reputation. Yeah, so I like to do like renders throughout as well, just to just to see what's going on and uh, changing mat caps and such as well. Uh, Peter Lin is saying, "Hey, just got here. I would like to know if uh, a beginner, if as a beginner prop and environment artist, would be suitable for purchase introduction to anatomy course." I would say instead of that one, I would say it's a better idea to get introduction to sculpting first. Because this is, it kind of builds on that. So this is it here. So I would say the order of things would be first, intro to ZBrush. Here, intro to ZBrush. And then, because then you learn how ZBrush works. I'm just going to send that link to that. And then intro to sculpting. And then, where, where did it go? Come on. It's going to be a link here somewhere. And we're going to have Intro to Anatomy. Might have not put it here. Yeah, then Intro to Anatomy, wherever that guy might be. <laughs> and then, um, then like, Realistic Character Portrait Masterclass as well. That's right here. I'm just going to find it as well. Because then you get to, like, combine everything here. I also, like, go down to the bottom here, and here you can see really good... Um, you can see really good recommendations for, for tutorials here, for this stuff. So you can just find tons of relevant courses there. So there are tons of really interesting ones. Here we go. Here is Intro to Sculpting. So these ones here are all really relevant. These are these are all 50% off now. So that's, that's by far the biggest discount we were ever doing. Like we these are never higher than 50%. We do some sales throughout the year, but this is, this is always the biggest one we have throughout the whole year. So definitely pick that up. Uh, it's going to be a year until the next Black Friday sale. Oh, 
All right, just seeing how long we've been going for here. We've been going for a while, two and a half hours. Okay, it's almost time to, to end this thing then, because uh, if I don't end the stream soon, then the stream is going to end me. Usually, whenever the stream is over, then I collapse, because it's uh, it's fun to do it, but it's also pretty tiring to do it. Also, I realize I've barely been sculpting on the screen right side. I've just been doing the screen left side. This needs a little bit more work. I really enjoy sculpting like, like this, just like doing nice asymmetrical sculpting. It's definitely not effective, but who cares? It's my character. What made you want to become a character artist rather than an environmental artist? I just like characters. <laughs> like, environments are cool. I just really like characters. Like, it's not more complicated <laughs> than that. It's not like uh, I didn't have some kind of matrix in front of me and, like, pros and cons of each. It was more like... I just think they're neat. <laughs> but I've also been doing this for such a long time that kind of by the time I had to choose what I wanted to do, it was almost like the choice was made for me. Because I started with Zebras in 2006. So went to sc finish school in 2014. So by that point, I've been doing it for such a long time that I've been doing Zebras throughout. And I tried out so many different things as well. Like at some point, the first job I had, a uh, tiny, tiny studio in Bergen, where I'm from in Norway, uh, I worked as a... I did like all sorts of different things, like as an intern there, but I also worked with lighting and comp, 3D Max and Fusion back in the day. So I got to try that out. In school, we tried all sorts of different things and I did tons of freelance stuff and I always just gravitated towards doing characters. So by the time it was time to choose, I'd also got like quite decent at it and I just kind of had a portfolio of characters because I'd just been doing it for some time. So I had tons of personal work as well. So it just became natural for me to do characters. But yeah, I know it's a bit of a different thing when people attend school and they're like, all right, now I have to choose. And you've been sculpting or doing 3D for like a year. <laughs> but it's a bit different thing when you've been doing it for such a long time at that point. I mean, at this point, I've been doing 3D for over half my life. Like by, by, by a fair bit. Actually, this year, this year is like half my life. So yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's quite some time. So Henning, what have you bought yourself for Black Friday? Any nice gadgets or games? I have not, but I've been thinking about maybe a longboard. So I sold my longboard some years ago, and uh, I kind of want a new one. I got really sad when I sold that one, so I kind of want a new one. Gonna probably get... My girlfriend is probably gonna buy a new laptop, so if you guys have new laptop suggestions for around £2,000 as well, let me know. These things here as well, this is where I'm, this is kind of a dirty workflow because they, these are clearly like bony things protruding through the skin and I just kind of sculpt them on top. Like this is, this is not how you should do it. Like this is, I don't think I would go to CG jail for this, but I would go to like CG detention for this. Like this is not fantastic, but you know, it's my sculpt. Nobody gets to tell me what to do. <laughs> so this is, uh, it's fine. And the reason you don't want to do this is because it's, it can cause issues in terms of like texturing and topology and all that kind of stuff. So you generally want like this kind of stuff to be supported in topology. Also means they can go way more high res. Yeah, let me know if you guys have bought anything cool for Black Friday as well. Always looking for for like deals there. It feels like most places now don't really do proper Black Friday deals. And also because of inflation as well, it seems like a good Black Friday deal now might just have been called going to the shop normally like two years ago. <laughs> MSI Raider. I'll check that out as well. Any impressive character models in games uh, this year that's got your approval? Well, this year? Hmm. Last year was a Elden Ring. Because that stuff is crazy. In terms of like technical stuff, I have no idea because I haven't analyzed that stuff. But in terms of like the designs, love the Elden Ring. Like the boss designs for Elden Ring are so unique, so interesting. Love, love, love that stuff. Fun game as well. This year, what have I bought this year? I bought Harry Potter this year. Didn't really like some of the character models there. <laughs> I thought they were obviously like good, right? But it didn't really like stand out to me. I think it was because the the facial performance and the acting was uh, was pretty subpar. Uh, I, I thought the goblins in the Harry Potter game and Hogwarts Legacy had way too long arms, <laughs> but I thought, I thought a lot of the creatures were cool. 
um i guess from last year the like god of war like ragnarok i really want i really want to play that as well that looks i mean anything with god of war looks brilliant i love what they're doing with those character models Is it so impressive to see the level of quality for for game models as well? They're, they're getting ridiculous. So I I just got a PlayStation for the first time like two years ago. That was the first time I had a I had a re, I had a PlayStation at all. Like last one was like Xbox 360, like way back. So I I hadn't really played games for a long time because we you know we started for almost and such. I had a Switch. I still have a Switch. So I played games on that. But so when I got a a PlayStation, I was basically like seven years behind like I, I couldn't really go further back than that because then games are getting old so i went black back to bloodborne and a lot of these like games from that era went back to not that that's old one but in her first new god of war game and just played that kind of stuff for some time so i'm still kind of catching up to like more recent games got completely obsessed with the souls games played sekiro bloodborne dark souls all those really enjoy that played them like four times each <laughs> I got completely addicted to to that particular like, Sekiro. I'm playing a lot of Neo 2 as well. Again, like it's a you know 2019 game or something, and then they remastered it. But like I really like Neo 2 as well. It's a really good game. Played Wu Long this year as well. Didn't enjoy that that much to be honest. I finally got myself a PS5 and finally started playing The Witcher 3. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, it's quite some time ago that came out. I, I, I keep starting Witcher 3 and then I get to, I can't remember what it's called, but the first city, the first real city. And then I, I don't get stuck, I just get bored. So I never really continue the game after that. I enjoy it up to that point and then I get sick of it. <laughs> My girlfriend is showing me some two pots with two rats in it, a pot with rats in it. I think they're growing from the pot. It's very cute. <laughs> How do you like to relax? Not sure I understand that word. Haven't been very good at relaxing. I really need to get better at that. Also been playing Skyrim recently as well. Such a such a fun game. Oh, and Stardew Valley. Such a good game. Keep playing Stardew Valley. Oh, and I played Hollow Knight this year. I, I've been playing it before, but this is the first time I, like, I, I actually finished it. To the degree you can finish it. I'm sure there are a lot of hidden bosses. That's why I loved Hollow Knight. The Dark Souls of Platformers. Yeah, I love game recommendations as well. If you guys have any cool games to recommend me, let me know. If not, I'm just going to go back to playing Sekiro for like the seventh time or something in like two years. If Driver is a Sekiro 2, I'm going to be a very happy man. I think this year was insane for games though. Terrible, terrible game for game developers absolutely horrific but like in terms of the actual output if you only judge it from that it's been brilliant uh, i want to play um baldur's gate 3 that looks brilliant as well got a war ragnarok absolutely on the list i was gonna buy that but then harry potter came out and i've been playing harry potter <laughs> i've been a fan for that for years so diablo 4 diablo 4 was, was fun for like the first few days and then i got bored with it uh, didn't don't really know why. I didn't really think too much about it. I just got bored from by Diablo 4. I really liked it at the beginning, and then it felt... Yeah, I don't really know. My girlfriend and I started playing Age of Empires 4 this week as well. <laughs> it's a really fun game. We're up until like 3 a.m. one night here. Had to wake up at 8. We were very destroyed the next day. Bought uh, Age of Empires 2 remastered as well, or remake, whatever it's called. We're gonna play that pretty soon. Looks really fun. Well, I played it for like 10 minutes. <laughs> it's really fun. I love these old style graphics.
All right, I think I'm going to start to finish this one here. So if you guys have any more questions or laptop or game recommendations, let me know. I would love to hear those. But if you have any more questions about sculpting or the industry or our amazing Black Friday sale, 50% off, tons of stuff, then um, yeah, let me know. And I'll probably just keep sculpting for like a few minutes more and then we'll, we'll just take it from there. Why are you still using Seabridge 2022? Any reason why you didn't upgrade? Yes, because it costs money to upgrade. So <laughs> uh, if, honestly, there hasn't really been anything new in the latest versions. The only new thing is really that you can, you know, backwards compatibility. The fact that if somebody sends me a file from 2023, then I can't open that. But yeah, it's it doesn't really offer anything new. It's pretty much exactly the same software for me. So yeah, I'm totally happy with this. But, you know, of course, we will have to upgrade at some point because we will, we, we haven't really made too many tutorials on it recently. But we will, of course, have to have to upgrade for those because we need to stay up to date on that. All right, cool. Then I think I will be uh, signing off. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for uh, stopping by. And um, we're probably going to be doing a few more Black Friday streams. Cyber Monday streams, whatever you want to call it. So, um, yeah, speak to you guys soon. And thank you so much for uh, for stopping by.